two contributors said uh, that I disagree with. Um, I think we do have a problem. Uh, schools uh, come back for year 12 and year 14 pupils on the 24th of August. Uh, teachers are asking uh, why uh, they were uh, ordered back into school uh, when it wasn't clear uh, what they were meant to be uh, teaching. Uh, in terms of uh, what C is doing, uh, we believe it's welcome. We have to act uh, to protect public health. We need to put uh, adaptions in place uh, that are going to make sure uh, that health uh, takes priority. Now, on balance, uh, what SIA are, are proposing uh, appears, appears appropriate, but as we go through the process, there needs to be a regular uh, contact between unions uh, and uh, CCEA uh, on this. Um, it's quite possible as we go forward that official guidance and scientific uh, evidence changes uh, we could well have partial or full closures of schools. So therefore, it's very important that uh, everyone is teaching uh, in the same order. Uh, so that if we do get to the point uh, where uh, schools uh, have to close, uh, that everyone will have covered uh, the same material. Um, now, one of the issues, I suppose, that hasn't come up and wasn't in the SIA consultation, but was in the off-qual uh, consultation, was around delaying the date of the start of GCSE exams in 2021. Uh, we think the committee uh, should look at what Ofqual is doing and if they can uh, make the point to them that this would be a mistake uh, because many uh, young people in Northern Ireland uh, study examinations through uh, English and Welsh awarding bodies and uh, it would be a major disruption if uh, CCEA were having exams at one point in time and the English awarding bodies were having them at a separate point in time. In terms of the consultation itself, it, need, it needed to happen. It should have happened before now, but we are where we are, so it needs to happen quickly. Uh, CCA need to listen uh, to the responses of all the practitioners who would be best placed uh, to make uh, to put in the input about each subject level. As a former maths teacher, though, I am concerned that for maths and English, there has been uh, no diminution in terms of the content. Uh, mathematics, uh, it, it is all skill-based, but there is a, a massive amount of content to cover uh, within the curriculum. Uh, you, you really do not get a break. It's topic after topic. Some days you'll be getting through two topics to get everything covered. Uh, so uh, hard decisions will need to be, must be made, and CS should listen to the practitioners and decide what should be examined uh, this year. Okay, thank you. Justin, can I bring in Bruna Wright, NEU? Um, Bruna Wright, uh, President of NEU. President of yeah. NEU, thank you, Bruna. Um, I just have a few things to say. I would like to just talk about communication, and I think that it's vital that the committee involve our leaders in the subject-specific uh, proposals. It is vital that they do that. Um, the NEU uh, committee would like to urge your committee to make sure that the positive changes that are implemented are for the future and are not temporary, that we're actually looking at developing the future of the education for our young people. Um, we would like to make sure that the standards are not lowered throughout this process, um, but the, contact, uh, you know, the, the content is reduced by an agreed percentage and that we move forward with that. The, we believe that the current system of assessment um, disproportionately disadvantages um, parts of our community and, and our young people, and that you know it is vital that we don't further disadvantage this group of young people moving forward. Um, I have a particular interest in those young people who, you know, are slightly um, well. They are outside the norm. They are in you know IOTA centres. They are in tuition services. You know, exceptional teaching arrangements, and I think it's, it is vital that. You know, we look at those young people and we look at the assessment procedures for those young people so that we don't further disadvantage them. Uh, I would like the committee as well to um, look at the idea of a transition year between senior, you know, year 14, year 12, to look at that, uh, you know, the one that's put forward by the National Council for Curriculum Assessment, and to, to maybe open that up to some young people in Northern Ireland where they would be supported by their school by you know, the counselling services, by the career services within schools, and it would be a structured programme to help them transition into you know, senior school you know, towards A-levels. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruna. And can I bring in Stephen McCord, uh, the UTU? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, we also welcome this here consultation and accept the changes are required, but it would have been preferable that this had been carried out much earlier. Schools and pupils have now started back, and some of these proposed changes are having an impact now. It's also worth noting here that the vocational qualifications, such as occupational studies and entry-level qualifications, have had no consultation yet, and this has to be addressed with urgency. May I also place on record that within the changes suggested, there are, uh, there are areas of inequity across subject areas, and CEO must consider the mental health and well-being of both pupils and staff. Even though schools are only back a few weeks, we are hearing from members of difficulties and pressures that are being placed on them and their students. If I could give a couple of concrete examples, at GCSE Single Award Science, the experimental unit has been removed. This means an important, and dare I say it, an enjoyable part of the assessment and an important skills-based assessment is no longer going to be there. Way of engaging students and assessing their skills. On the other hand, the double award science, the experimental skills unit is still there. However, we also have to look at year 11 because lots of those exper experiments should have been undertaken then, which is causing a workload issue. And in any normal year, completing this course can prove challenging. But with the restrictions now in schools, it's going to prove problematic. The same thing happens at AS and A2. Some practicals have been removed. In other subjects, they remain. It might have been better that the content could be reduced in some of these. For example, at Life and Health Science, instead of doing 12 practicals, it could have been reduced. And as already mentioned, some subject areas have had no reduction the modern languages continue to be assessed in all units. This is extremely unfair, especially when compared to other subject areas. The skills of speaking, listening, reading and writing are very important and should be assessed. But GCSE French, for an example, has a vocabulary list of almost 100 pages in length. And by having no content reduced, this may disadvantage some of our students who will be overwhelmed by the amount of work that will need to be completed this year. It's going to dampen their enthusiasm and enjoyment for this subject area and will reduce the numbers possibly wishing to study a language post-16. In consultation with a group of our post-primary members, one of the overwhelming messages we received was that the proposed changes will have a disproportionate negative impact on the young people in non-selective schools. This combined with maintaining the full curriculum for English language and maths to be completed in this year is in a seriously reduced amount of time, in our, the opinion of our members, will only serve to widen the divide in attainment. Add to that the fact that the teachers of the vocational courses haven't received any proposals for content on moving forward. It's our concern that the worrying message we are hearing is that these proposals serve our children in grammar schools much more effectively than our young people in non-selective schools. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen, and thank you to all of our, our witnesses for your contributions <coughs> today. Um, I move to questions from members straight away then, and can I invite uh, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA. Thank you, everybody, um, for attending today again and giving us that update. Uh, there was broad consensus um, across a wide spectrum of, of uh, educational stakeholders that the delivery of the curriculum this year should be amended to create a space to focus on students' mental health and well-being after coming back after many months of disruption. So it's very concerning to hear from yourselves today. It just points out, I suppose, the lack of involvement that yourselves have had and input up to this stage. Like yourselves, I share many of your concerns, particularly around uh, the delay in us only starting to do, I'd say only starting to do this consultation now when we knew for many months that it had to take place. Very concerned to hear from yourselves in relation to the vocational uh, courses that the consultation hasn't even started and that is something we'll be addressing next, next week with them. Um, I would also be concerned that there hasn't been any major adaptions to the AS or A2 courses. 
um, beyond the necessary public health adaptions, share your concerns around um, those um, uh, who are already disadvantaged will be more disadvantaged, so we need to see what's going to be popping plus um, in relation to that. Uh, I suppose speaking as a parent, and I have to declare an, uh, uh, an interest, I have a daughter in year 12, and she's already missed two days of school. She is a pupil throughout her whole school journey, had full attendance. Um, now, we're lucky that it was, it was only two days. It was a cold. You just know all the issues that's going on in schools, so it was better to be safe than sorry. But very, very concerned in relation to she must out so much, like many other pupils. Um, and if she's going to continue, and we're going to see classes being sent home, years being sent home. So wanted to ask in relation to, I know what was touched on, Simon, by yourself at the start, do we know at this stage what blended learning is, is going to look like? Do does teachers know on the ground and how it's going to be um, put into practice? Is all that in place uh, that now, you know, and is ready to go for those children that may have to be at home for short or lengthy periods? Yeah, well, schools, I think all, all schools move very, very quickly, almost overnight, um, back in, in March to move from a, a fully face-to-face -face, uh, engagement to, to a blended approach. Um, many schools used different platforms. Our own school used uh, Google Classroom. Now, towards the end of term, we did look at the strengths and, and the weaknesses of that. But if I give you an example of, of last year's year 11, um, that are now this year's year 12s, um, we, we had surveyed the staff within Devonish College, and the, the feedback was that 50% of the pupils were fully engaged. Uh, with the with the blended learning, about 25% of the pupils were, you know, drop, dropping in and out. Yeah. But about 25% of students had little or no engagement uh, with 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 pupils. And of course, then teachers are are um, walking the, the fine line and the balance of, you know, you might say, well, why didn't you contact those students and see, you know, and we did. But we were walking a very fine line of not putting additional pressure on, onto those students in that we, we weren't always totally aware of home circumstances or access to, to ICT. I think a lot of, a lot, what a lot of schools are doing now is they are setting up a, a, a default position of maybe setting homeworks uh, using, using blended, blended learning. But again, it's not without its challenges. And we most definitely appreciate the support that, that DE have put in place in, in the supply of additional uh, additional devices, um, but there is still a huge issue, especially in rural rural area like Fermanagh, um, to access to, to ICT provision. I, I can assure you, we are trying our yeah. absolute best, but it's something that we are incredibly nervous about uh, about having to move to that to that blended learning approach. Um, we hope that if we do have to move to that approach, it will be in the short term basis, yeah. and we hope that it, we won't have another lockdown. Uh, like like what we experienced uh, in the in the summer term, but most definitely we're deeply concerned from the point the point of view of the pupils. Um, yeah. And and see if I could supplement that because it's it's going to be as well. How does a teacher manage then their own class, and how does principals also manage staff absences? Because as this goes on, we're going to see that teachers will also have to isolate. Um, so. Um, you know, are you confident enough that the department is going to give the resources to be able to provide the blended learning in the absence of the teachers in the school being able to do it? Or um, we had this discussion last week in relation to staff absences being covered um, because it's 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 going to be very very like yourself concerned about difficult to manage. Yeah. No, look, in, in, in light of in light of previous experiences as, as a school leader, I can't say that I am confident uh, in DE's response. I think they've been they've been quite slow in a lot of their responses across across a broad uh, spectrum of 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 issues. Um, but I do have confidence in the profession yeah. uh, that they will do everything within their power yeah. uh, to make sure that the interests of the pupils are 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 best served uh, in in that in that regard. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I think sorry, it has, sorry, it has yeah. to be recognised that uh, you know, in, in lots of schools and uh, educational centres, there has to you know there has been a complete programme and a structure put in to you know educate both teachers and pupils, you know, within blended learning, and you know with the addition of the device uh, scheme, 
you know, even just now with those devices coming in July, you know, there's been programs put in to, you know, even get some of the young people interested in that type of learning. And I know, and I do know that for some of our young people with mental health issues, they have really responded extremely well to that. But I think there has to be recognition at the time that uh, you know teachers have to adapt, pupils have mm -hmm. to adapt, and the effect that that's going to have. Thank you, Bruna. Thank sorry, you. Can, I, can I yeah. make a comment, please? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, still not used to these these old, uh, meetings and getting, getting people's attention. Anyway, uh, on, 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 too, you lose your breath, you lose your turn. Oh, Away you okay. go. Okay, right. okay, thank you, <laughs> thanks, Chris. Um, listen, um, on, on the blended learning thing, and I stand open to correction here, but to the best of my knowledge, I was looking into this recently. The last uh, direction from the DE with, with regards to remote learning, as it was referred to at the time, w was on the 6th of June um, in, a, in a document whose which is, the name escapes me. It's sitting here on my desk somewhere. But um, uh, And again, there was, I understand, supposed to be some planning in terms of um, training for blended learning uh, and some additional provision for uh, schools, uh, teachers, to be able to, to provide that. Because it does relate, I think, as Karen is alluding to, to um, not just wholesale uh, school closures or indeed uh, closures of classrooms, but I referred also to pupils perhaps on, uh, who may have some disability, which has led to them uh, being advised to remain at home. Uh, provision is not necessarily uh, very clear or direct for those particular pupils. Um, so I, I do believe uh, the department needs to deliver um, it's the education authority needs to deliver on uh, previous promises on, around um, training for um, the uh, blended learning approach uh, and rolling that out to schools, to centres, to practitioners. Um, in terms of staff absences and funding, I think the, the direct answer is, is no, we, we are still unclear and schools, uh, th this office is taking calls on a day and daily basis from very, very frustrated and stressed out school leaders uh, and teachers who, uh, who do not know where the money is coming from to cover for the absences that will inevitably result, not inevitably result, they are, result they are happening as we speak. Um, there are people being sent home from schools on a day and daily basis, staff and pupils. The money has yet to be identified and the, the, the level of the funding is yet to be uh, established at a level which we feel would uh, actually cover the, the, the additional expenses to schools. And that's making life very, very difficult for school leaders in particular. OK, so just you, very Kate. briefly for bringing back in, Karen, um, just for members and witnesses, that's eight minutes 30, yeah. OK, just to give you an idea of how concise we need to try to be to get through our sessions. Sorry. I'll let Karen ask one quick question and maybe take one quick response. I need to get as many members and as many um, witnesses in as possible across yeah. the session, obviously. Karen? Uh, you jumped ahead of me, Chair. I was actually going to finish there and no just problem. say that I would be interested, obviously there's so much more, but to let other people in, um, I would really like to see the detail in relation to EOTIS, and it's something that we'll pick up after this. We'll go to the department. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Robin Newton, do you want no, to come in? Or? Okay, okay, okay for now, Robin. For yeah, no problem. Da no problem. Yeah. No problem at all. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to our guests, uh, Justin, Stephen, Kevin, and Bruna. You're very welcome, um, uh, and your comments uh, are uh, all in line with uh, the concerns that I have shared on behalf of the SDLP over the course of the last uh, few weeks and months. Uh, the entire situation around examinations has been entirely regrettable and very badly handled by SIA and by uh, the department. Uh, I, I have struggled to find anyone that would agree with that. Uh, e even when you look at what has happened uh, in England and other parts of the UK, there has been a strong level of accountability in ensuring that such uh, chaos does not happen again and that there has been a review of the processes. It is regrettable that we haven't seen uh, such uh, accountability here. Um, I know that the uh, leaders of, or, or those in senior positions of leadership uh, within Ofqual and other boards across England have left to allow for new leadership given the impact that this has, has had across England and absolutely has had across Northern Ireland. I've never seen children so devastated when those original results came out. I've never seen teachers so stressed, parents so worried, doctors, GPs reaching out uh, for someone to challenge and do something about 
uh, this uh, unjustified action. Luckily, it was uh, action was taken at the last minute, uh, following pressure on the minister. But there still remain significant questions about SIA and about who regulates them uh, and about the back off accountability with processes that they have inflicted that has absolutely uh, had an ad adverse effect on our young people and on our schools. Uh, I know that most of you agree with that. I I'm not confident uh, with SIA or its leadership at the present time. Uh, and I'm very comfortable in saying that because for a number of months, I have raised serious concerns in line with the reality that we've all seen uh, in the course of the last number of weeks. Uh, those concerns were ignored, um, they were brushed over, uh, and because of that, uh, and concerns raised by others, I just have no confidence in the current leadership of SIA, uh, and certainly in terms of some of the proposals that have been put on the table of late. You keep uh, telling them this term. next week, remember, Daniel, so you might want to get the question yes. sooner rather than later. Good man. And in, terms, in terms of the uh, proposals, I, I also have no confidence that uh, children will not be disadvantaged by uh, the proposals on the table by ACS. There is concern around that. Blended learning, Karen Mullen regularly brings up blended learning. It, it is something that I have great concern about, particularly given that in order for blended learning to work effectively, we need a system that works and that can be reliable. C2K, as you will all know, is three years out of date. Uh, and there has been no tender process whatsoever put out uh, uh, from the department uh, in order to ensure that the system is up to standard and reliable. Uh, is there any concerns from yourselves that has been expressed to the Department of Education that would ensure that if we do revert to a situation where there is another lockdown, blended learning will be heavily relied on, even more so uh, than it is at the present time? Do you agree that we need to move, or do you have any concerns around the C2K system, and have those concerns been raised by various uh, teachers across the north. Okay, so C2K capacity to deal with a further more significant lockdown and, and blended learning in general. Who would like to respond? Okay, I, I'll go. Okay, go ahead, Justin. Okay, uh, Daniel, yeah, on C2K, uh, it is a ridiculous position that the system hasn't been uh, upgraded uh, when that has been due. But the point I would make, if we want to get blended learning right, uh, we need uh, people to carry it out. Unfortunately, many schools are now trying to operate as if uh, COVID never happened. Now, it's not all schools, but many of them are now using teachers' time just as they would have normally. And our message to them is, look, if you're going to have blended learning, you need to plan for it, and you need to plan uh, your human resources. If, if all you're focusing on is doing everything as you did before, you won't be able to do it. We also need more people. We need more teachers uh, to be recruited uh, into schools to actually manage uh, and set up uh, blended learning. Uh, taking a subject like maths, it would be eminently sensible to have one math specialist to set up something uh, for the entire school to free that person to actually get it up and running so that if, it, when, if and when the inevitable happens and schools may have to close, either in localised areas or generally, that there's something up, sitting ready to go, all the resources uh, are in place, and hopefully uh, issues around uh, equipment and broadband, <coughs> with, and we can actually get on uh, with teaching those young people. It's a helpful answer. Any, any, any other witnesses want to respond to that briefly before bringing Daniel back in again? Oh, I think we could, Chair, we could, we could dedicate a full session to, to C2K and issues uh, related uh, around C2K. But I do agree with Justin, there are some subjects that lend themselves much easier uh, to blended learning uh, than, than others. One of, the, one of the subjects that has absolutely no mitigations in the CA consultation are languages. And uh, in terms of the delivery of languages online in the form of blended learning is next to impossible. And that's, that's one of the main concerns that, that our um, language departments uh, have. I think with regards to the C2K, we can find workarounds, and the profession have been excellent in terms of finding workarounds uh, to, those, to those solutions. I think if, if you're on Facebook or Twitter at the minute and you see the work that the teaching profession is doing in terms of setting up um, you know, subject support uh, for each other, career support, special educational needs support, even NISTRA support for substitute teachers, the work that the profession is doing is absolutely phenomenal in terms of seeking workarounds. But one thing that we 
most definitely cannot have a workaround is what CIA is specifying to us that we must teach in order to meet our, our statutory obligations. And that, that is worrying. As, as an organisation, we are seeking solutions to this. And as, as, a, as a school principal, I'm more than happy to offer uh, heads of department, teaching staff to work with CIA to really focus in on that content and get that content reduced to a manageable level. But there are some things that we can work around, C2K being one of them, but in terms of, of specifications that CIA are stipulating, there is, there is no work around. If they're saying that it must be delivered, then it must be delivered. And that's what we find an impossible uh, situation. Thank you, Simon. Um, Daniel, do you want to, sorry, Bruno, you want to come in briefly and then bring Daniel back in? I just wanted to talk very briefly about NISTRA because I think there needs to be a complete review of NISTRA and how that is used because I know that principals, you know, they're going to become more and more under pressure to find staff and, you know, they're, having, they're, they're actually finding other ways now to look for substitute teachers and I think that we really need a review of NISTRA to get up to date with, you know, on social media and things to accommodate principals and make the, the finding of teachers much easier. Two, two key issues there. If, if the uh, unions wish to give the committee more information mm -hmm. on issues with C2K and NISTRA be um, um, well received. Daniel, bring you back in there. Yeah, uh, Brona, absolutely. I would agree with the review of Mr. Register. I think it is appropriate given the crisis situation that we're in uh, and to support students. But I think <clears throat> the point made uh, previously by uh, uh, another witness uh, in relation to SIA uh, is spot on. Uh, SIA don't seem to listen to reality. They don't seem to be listening to those at the cold face that are uh, dealing and adapting to the crisis in order to best meet the needs of, and the interests of our children and young people, and that is our teachers, who we will be indebted to for quite some time, given the sacrifices uh, that they have made for our young people to ensure they are educated and have found solutions to complex situations in order to ensure uh, a lesser disruption to children and young people. See, and need to listen. They need to listen to people like yourselves. They need to listen to your schools. They need to listen to people raising concerns because up until now, see, they have not listened. They've died in the ditch for their own ideas and refuse to listen to others. And uh, uh, certainly that would be unacceptable from my perspective, and the SDLP's perspective, and others in the committee. We need to ensure that we adapt uh, to the changing uh, environment that we're in get the needs of people, young people, and I totally agree with that. Final point, Chair, yep. uh, it's around the outbreak schools we have seen, uh, uh, outbreaks in various schools across Northern Ireland uh, in the last week. Uh, uh, three, uh, my own constituent, the Arvely Holy Cross College, and, uh, Cross College sorry, Arvely, uh, St Mary's uh, Primary School in Strabane, and uh, the other being uh, Drumrat and Degree College in Oma. Uh, they have expressed considerable concern uh, uh, whenever the outbreak comes because huge pressure applies on the school from the public, from parents, asking what schools are going to do. Other principals have since reached out to me and asked, particularly in towns uh, where there's a number of schools where there's no testing facilities, uh, that there would be. Because if there's symptoms, that child is expected to be off for two weeks, uh, particularly at the start of the school term, that causes considerable disruption uh, to a child's start in the year, particularly a first year pupil. Uh, the, the principal of Holy Cross College has shared those concerns with me. Now, I, I spoke with the minister yesterday and he said that each school will receive 10 testing kits. Well, what is your view around how we tackle that? Uh, and I know that's a very general question, but do, do you believe there should be, the PHA should be looking to have uh, testing units in every town and village to ensure minimal disruption, which would help the education of our young people? Because if a child is tested when they show symptoms and the symptoms and it proves negative, then that child can be straight back into education and would avoid distress and stress to uh, the school, the parent, and the child and others as well. Okay. I'll bring you, I'll bring you straight in. Um, that, that's definitely Daniel out of time. Um, but in terms of responding, um, it's, it's obviously not related to the CA consultation. It is something that I would encourage us to raise with DE and EA later on. However, if someone does, it would be uh, worthwhile getting a response from our witnesses in relation to testing very, very briefly, and then that, and then I'll move on. Justin, you wanted to speak briefly. If other witnesses wish to come in, I think you have a facility on Starleaf where you can um, digitally raise your hand or, or make yourself known to me. I can see you on the screen here as well. Justin? Okay, look, I, I agree with the point. Every, uh, every town of a reasonable size should certainly have its own testing facilities. Uh, now, there's been a lot of controversy over how the testing kits were given out to schools. It, it was shambolic. Uh, schools have 10 kits. You know, 10 kits isn't really going to, to deal with it. 
no one even knows who's actually responsible once the test is carried out uh, for sending it on. Uh, we can't have, it's not the job of schools uh, to manage health. Um, there should be somewhere within each local town, whether it's a pharmacy or it's paid to do it, where uh, these things can be done, uh, not, not on schools. Schools have uh, too much to be doing in relation uh, uh, to teaching. And, uh, and there is a real fear among principals that they are going to be responsible for policing whether somebody actually gets uh, the test done or not. Okay. Any other witnesses want to respond very briefly to the issue of testing before we move on? Kevin, you have your hand raised, yeah? Yeah, just, just very briefly, uh, what schools also need, along with everything that Justin has said, is very, very clear advice and guidance on what to do when there is a positive test or uh, a pupil or a member of staff sent home with, with uh, symptoms. Um, it was clear from yesterday's media coverage that, that and, and indeed clear from our experiences as uh, and representing members in schools, there is huge confusion out there. So whatever the outcome of testing, we need clear guidance in schools as to how to respond and react. Yeah, yeah, that's coming through strongly. Okay, um, Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Simon, Bruno, Justin, Kevin, Stephen. I will talk as fast as possible, give as little preamble, and ask as many questions as we can. And if you could keep your answers short, but 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 good, it would be much appreciated. Okay. So if you give us the right answers, we can move on and, and, and cover some stuff. Okay. I'm just going to uh, say to Justin very quickly. Justin, I'm going to give you a compliment. You, you read out a little statement I thought was very good. Um, I'm not asking for the answer because it's, you, it's not yours to answer, but why was a return on the 24th so important for certain years when this hadn't been sorted out with regard to the curriculum and the exams? And that's obviously what we're talking about today. So that, I just want to thank you for bringing that up. Um, each of the ministers across all of the portfolios so far um, have had a reasonable defence in that they've said that they haven't had hindsight um, to tackle the problems that COVID has bring. However, we now have hindsight, and that is why uh, we are bringing up the topics that we're bringing up today. And it is about building confidence for teachers and for pupils and for parents and removing as much of that stress as possible. But one of, one of the first things that, that stood out to me today is the conformity and unity with regard to cohorts of pupils who may be disadvantaged. Um, and obviously the Minister has undertaken to, to look at some of the, uh, that disadvantage in the reports and so on that have been made. And obviously uh, children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds um, are markedly disadvantaged and, and not, not exclusively but predominantly from um, Protestant males are, are, are certainly disadvantaged. Um, also, just want to add in a couple of other cohorts of children which I'm particularly interested in, and that's looked after children and then children who care because um, each of those um, cohorts of children have additional responsibilities that are hidden from teachers as well. And sometimes it's kind of unknown in schools, uh, FSM kids and, and BM kids as well. So could, could anybody just speak into that? And Simon, perhaps, I think maybe you brought it up first, Simon, with regard to that, with regard to any cohorts, particularly that may be identified as disadvantaged with the approach that is being needed? Well, a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the groups you have talked about there, we would place under the umbrella of you know, children with, with special educational needs, and they, they are most definitely uh, a, a, a grouping of students that we are particularly worried about. Um, in a lot of cases, with the, with the, current, um, with the current consultation position uh, that CIA have taken, you know, a lot of those students are using um, the, the, the controlled assessment aspect of their assessments have now been removed, mm -hmm. and those are the areas that those students, with a lot, you know, with guidance and support from from the teaching staff, would use almost to prop up uh, their their eventual grades. Because quite often for those students, their their performance in the external examination is is what is what uh, lowers them down. So mm -hmm. we we do have we do have severe concerns about that. But as I mentioned earlier, we are more than keen to try and come up with solutions to this. Uh, we think at at GCSE level, the solution has to be looking at the, the content reductions. Uh, the CIA have taken a position that 40% uh, is the maximum amount of reduction that, that, they will, that they will permit, but 15 subjects they have identified that will have no reductions whatsoever. Quite a few of those is because the two units that they said are worth 50%. So again, as practitioners, we're more than willing to sit down with CIA and see what reductions can be made that will have a more even spread uh, across so that there are less pupils that are that are particularly disaffected. For the year 13 pupils moving on into year 14, we believe that the solution to this 
is that the centre assessed grades that were awarded to the students in year 13 should contribute in a meaningful, constructive way to the overall grade that's then awarded uh, at, 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 at year 14. Because, you know, the, the, there was quite a lot of uh, press speculation with regards to um, the calculation of those grades and did teachers just pluck these grades out, out, of, out of the air. I can assure you, within our school, we spent three weeks with a detailed analysis. The, pupils, uh, the teachers had to produce evidence as to why they were awarding that particular grade. There was then a, a structure of the head of department uh, having an, an, a, a management of that. The vice principals then had a, 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 a check and balance on that. And then as the principal before, and I know all principals were in this situation, before we signed it off as head of centre, we were, we were adamant that those grades were fair. Uh, that, that, were, that were being awarded. And what we would like to do as far as possible is to draw a line under year 11, draw a line under year 13, and allow those uh, students to move forward beginning now in September. But the biggest worry is how flexible will the system be for, for lockdown at a candidate level, at a school level, and even at a systems level? And we were able to flexibility within okay. the system. We'll let Bruno in here because Bruno didn't Yeah, Bruno and, and, and then Stephen McCord wanted to come in briefly I can, as I well. I asked him to make it short because yeah, I'd like I, I'll, I'll allow for multiple witnesses coming in on your own. Yeah, you. Bruno, yeah, okay. thank you. Just very, very quickly because that is an area where I've worked for 11 years yeah. uh, with, with those young people who are seeking further support from the Education Authority to you know, fulfil up to the, you know, the, their GCSE level. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's vitally important that we don't lower our standards, but we look at the content uh, you know, of what we're expected. Because sometimes we will get young people coming out of school you know, in year 11 and year 12, and we're expecting them, you know, even in year 12, to move from having no evidence of anything, you know, because they're looked after, because they've been out of education systems. And we are, you know, first of all, building their confidence, building their relationship with education. And then we are moving them through different exam boards, not just SEA, you know, to build their confidence in terms of speaking and like listening for English. And sometimes we only get them to a certain place, you know, maybe February, March to set even a level one, then to get into GCSE. So we need to be very, very clear about the evidence that is needed for those pupils to achieve the, the highest standard that they can achieve and give them the supports regarding mental health and all the issues, trauma that they have, you know, psychology support and things like that. I mean, even in ETA at the minute, our, the young people in ETA are still not getting one-to-one -one education. And that's something that needs to vitally move forward very quickly. You know, direction is given for that to happen. So, uh, you know, they're already disadvantaged. We don't want them to be disadvantaged any further. Yeah. Robbie, let me bring Stephen yes. McCord in briefly there as well. Yeah, I just, just wanted to mention that we have pupils who are entitled to special access arrangements mm -hmm. and already being reported to our union is that psychos are under immense pressure uh, because it's proving challenging at this time as schools adapt um, to getting that testing done and it's something that we have called for that CA should consider having an extension for that and that would be for the, the pupils of 2022. Yeah, and if, if I could just add to that, Chair. Very briefly, in, in, yeah. In the, original, uh, in the original guidance that came out to schools in terms of the awarding of centre assessed grades, we were told uh, that the special consideration that's normally given to, to pupils, we were told that we were to make allowances for that within the centre assessed grade. But then whenever the, whenever the algorithm was used, the centre assessed grades were totally ignored. Right. And those pupils were, uh, uh, you know, suffered immensely. Yep. Uh, immensely. And in this current consultation that exists, there is... That there is no recognition for a lot of the a lot of the students that you that you have alluded to. And, uh, I'm, I'm pleased okay. with the yeah, Robert. I'm pleased with the answer, Chair, because I've I've no doubt given what happened before and so far where we are with what CCF produced that the most disadvantaged will be further disadvantaged, mm. and that's perverse and that that can't happen. So thank you for that. Um, I think you guys have already picked up on this, but I'm going to roll this one into two, and it's to do with the AS grades. So I mean, I have, I've said from the start that the AS grades that were awarded this year should go through. They shouldn't be phantom grades. I mean, that will alleviate um, a lot of the problem. And then if we look back to um, how GCSEs and the A-levels are taught, schools don't necessarily teach units in numerical order. So I think, um, wh where would you guys be with regard to optional questions to deal with the reduced or missed content in terms of that strategy for, for examinations? In 2021. Uh, that, so that's something uh, that the NASUWT uh, would be in favour of uh, because it will allow children uh, and young people to access questions uh, at right level 
and may take account of what has happened in years 13 or 14 in terms of uh, what has been covered. Because yeah, it's, not, it's not the case on every subject that AS is uh, totally discreet uh, from A2. There will be skills that transfer from one into the other. So uh, giving people the choice of what uh, question uh, to pick uh, means that uh, if education is disrupted, everyone will be able to access uh, part of the exam. Yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. Stephen. Stephen McCord and, uh, wanted to come in on that briefly as well, then I can bring others in, yeah. yeah. Stephen? Yeah, I, I was just going to mention, for example, history and geography. History has, has taken one unit out, which is usually taught in year 12, so history has taken that unit out, which means that those pupils are going to repeat their previous units, whereas in geography they've taken the year 11 unit out. So it's, it's, it's not equal across subjects. Um, certainly our members were actually against optional questions in papers. And the reason for that would be that some of our pupils would go in and they would answer all the questions. It takes preparation, it takes a skill to identify which question you have to answer. Yeah. Okay, something uh, to guard I, against. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I previously taught history and under... Under the, 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 the previous assessments when I was teaching that, uh, pupils would go in with maybe a 70-page booklet uh, of questions, but they might only have to answer 15. And a lot of those students at, at GCSE level would have found it uh, difficult to decipher which questions they had to answer and which, which questions they, they didn't. But, uh, and so the solution that I would see at GCSE level is a reduction in content mm -hmm. negotiated with the teaching profession. But I, I do see that optional questions at AS and A2 would be a very positive way to move forward. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think final, final quick yeah, point, I, Robbie. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Chair. I think that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, so I think, and, and the solution is somewhere in between the two, but it has to be a negotiated um, uh, uh, agreement. Um, so this one here, guys, uh, is... I don't need to think any, anybody needs to respond to this, but I've said this from the very start, from blended learning was muted. Um, I don't think we're digitally mature enough here in Northern Ireland to either instruct, teach, learn, and then te test based on digital inequity. I think that anything and any solution that is found has to be solely based on face-to-face -face teaching. I don't think there's anything to replace it. I think there's a place for blended learning and a contingency and then an emergency and only used if needed. So in terms of the plan the CCA have, I hope there's an ABC plan here. And A is face-to-face -face teaching. And blended learning is only used because I see a burden on teachers. I see a burden on uh, the availability of broadband of the provision. Also at home, we know, we know that the kids are getting the most support at home. So if you're not getting the support at home or the instruction at home, it's, a, it's complex, as, as we know. So I just wanted to put it on, on record okay. here. Yeah. Thank if, you, if Robbie. I, if I can briefly just uh, come in it on that. It need to be very, very brief, uh, well, Simon. Uh, yep. I, I sat on a, on a consultation group that CIA had back at the, at the beginning of June with school principals, and they were working on five different scenarios in terms of where we would move forward in this. Scenario one was that there would be absolutely no interrup interruption whatsoever to learning come September. And then scenario two was limited, and scenario three working its way to scenario five, where there was complete lockdown. This model of consultation is based on scenario one, well, yeah. which is that there would be no interruption, and that is just not going to be the case. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So, so very briefly, the, in terms of the practitioner group and the stakeholder group that was put in place as part of school restart planning, are, are those two groups not being utilised at this moment in time for either school restart or curriculum and assessment 2020-2021? Not, sure. Not as far as you're aware. They seem to me like sensible ways to enhance the sub substance of this consultation. I'll maybe come back to that. I, I, I just wanted to, to check in. Can I bring Catherine Kelly in, please? Thank, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you all for your contributions this morning. Um, I'll be brief in my questions, as you've answered most that was on my list um, this morning. It's hugely important for us to hear your issues and concerns at this crucial time, and you've raised many important points, especially the fact that we should be looking to the future on this and ensuring that every single young person across the North is advantaged as opposed to disadvantaged by the changes. In relation to the current consultation, um, do you believe that the proposed changes have the scope to be agile in response to the changing circumstances as the year progresses? Um, can I just answer that briefly? Uh, no. 
Um, and I think the point has been made by myself and, and, and virtually everybody else has contributed um, that, that what's in front of us, or what we have read, what has been sent to schools um, and, and the wider community is a plan. It's, that it needed to be a number of plans. It needed to, to uh, reference uh, the various scenarios which have just been mentioned there. So in short, no, and we need something very soon. Well, we need something very soon initially, but we also need uh, a range of planning for for a number of scenarios. Anyone else? No. Any, other witnesses? Any other witnesses want to come in on that? I do have some sympathy with Sia uh, in the situation that they find themselves in, and especially at GCSE. It's the flexibility that we have within the system that is actually causing so much difficulty here in terms of modules and when you set them and how you set them and, and so on and so on. But I still believe that the solution is a negotiated uh, settlement with the teaching profession. Mm -hmm. and, and because teachers want to make this work for the benefit of the pupils, school leaders want to make this work for the benefit of the pupils, and that is absolutely necessary. Okay, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, for, for those contributions. Um, and just lastly, um, what other other than the public consultation um, has SIA and the department engaged with the unions? Is there a willingness um, on their part to engage currently um, on the consultation and all other restart issues? Uh, I would say uh, to that, Catherine, that if you go looking for a meeting with them, they'll meet you, but they're not proactive in terms of wanting to meet with us. Yeah. But that's not how it should be. Would any other yeah. witnesses like to comment on, on given the time scales that we're talking here, what what formats of engagement yeah. with the teaching pre profession might be suggested? Yeah, to, to, to be fair, we have had some limited for, informal engagement with them. Um, and, and that would be you know, just in the interest of full disclosure here. We did, uh, a couple of us have a chat with, with uh, some CA representatives. Um, but nothing formal uh, beyond that. Um, I, I, I've called for, as have colleagues on NITC, uh, for arrangements to be regularly reviewed throughout the, uh, the pandemic situation and indeed beyond. Um, we do need longer term planning as well and, and those two things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, we can be doing them at the same time. But it needs to, we need to establish mechanisms in my own, I'll go back to the beginning of my own contribution uh, INTO would call for mechanisms to be established by which we can have regular review throughout this situation uh, of, of the, the changing situation based on public health, the uh, public health situation and how it affects schools uh, both across the system, locally, regionally, wherever. And Chair, I, 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 Simon wants to I, come in briefly. I apologise for Labour in this point, but I think I, I speak on behalf of, of school leaders that we would be willing even in light of the situation with, with staff and shortages, we would be willing to release some members of staff to go and work with SIA to really draft this out, to make it work, uh, and a representation across selective, non-selective, special, uh, other educational settings, that we can, we can make this work. Um, but this needs to happen this week and next week, and that guidance to, to staff needs to be here by the end of the month at the absolute latest. Okay. Catherine? Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that, um, Simon and Kevin and Justin. Um, I think that we can see how crucial and, and paramount it actually is um, for there to be engagement. Um, and when we don't do that, that's whenever um, there are many issues um, that, that are raised. So it'll be something that I'll be uh, speaking to uh, SIA and also the department about to ensure that that engagement um, is regular um, and that um, you're consulted at, at all um, points and parts of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Justin McNulty. Simon, Kevin, Stephen, Justin and Bruno for your very valuable contributions this morning. I'm um, very, very worried to hear what uh, Bruno and Stephen said in terms of the uh, impact potentially on disadvantaged children from disadvantaged areas. Um, in terms of the assessment system now as it stands, um, disadvantaging young people from certain backgrounds and the proposed changes will disproportionately uh, have a neg negative impact on non-selective schools and will widen the attainment gap. Can you, can you possibly both give me more information from that perspective? 
Well, if, if I maybe come in first of all, um, maths and English are continuing to be examined in all their, their units, which would appear to be a complete turnaround from what Sear had suggested at the end of the last academic year. And that impact is already being felt not only by the teachers, but by the students, because they're being told in some subjects that, that assessed units will not be you know, examined. But now, all of a sudden, they have all of their work to be assessed in year 12. And that is having an impact on the mental health and well-being of our students. Um, and it's also because of what we're going through at the minute. The time is limited. And already, I have been speaking to teachers, by the time they get pupils in and get them set, settled, there's time wasted. And we need to think about that. And we need to think about reducing the content that's going to be examined in some subject areas. Steve, you talk about the impact of the mental health on students um, there, and we've been told at previous committees by the Education Authority, by DE, that there will be an increased provision, increased supports available for the mental health for students and teachers. What evidence do you see of that on the ground now? Well, looking at my own school, um, I know that you know extra counselling sessions are available, um, and I know that's been put out on our Facebook page and the website. So, really, you know, the uptake of it is limited at the minute. Um, but like some of the resources need to be going out into schools and being proactive, uh, because some of the students um, have to be encouraged to come forward whenever they've had these 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 issues. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Yeah. Anybody else want to add anything further on that? Yeah, well, I, I would just like to talk just about mental health and those uh, disadvantaged young people because sort of in um, some of the services within my own sector, we have gone from having dedicated mental health professionals, uh, you know, have worked alongside the Northern Ireland Counselling Services uh, for schools, uh, you know, and th they are no longer there. And I do, you know, think that that, that area for, for not just young people within, you know, support services within the Education Authority, but also within schools, you know, young people are, are, are adjusting and they will be adjusting for an awfully long time. And I think it's an area that we really, really need to be very mindful of and be very sensitive to the effects that all of our young people really within education have gone through. And we need to support schools with proper resources to do that. Justin, can I just supplement that very briefly to, to Bruna as well? So does the SEA uh, proposals on curriculum and assessment for 2020-21 say anything about what the Minister and the Department spoke previously in terms of um, educational and emotional health and wellbeing recovery? Not that I'm really? aware of. Okay. okay, Justin, bring you back in there. Okay, so obviously it's a, it's a very huge concern. I think, I think both DE and EA need to put huge emphasis and focus on the impact of, on children's mental health and children and young people's mental health. What mitigations can be put in place to avoid children uh, missing out if they miss time in terms of units of learning? Does it need to be more prescriptive at the current time to ensure that the context in one school won't disadvantage their pupils more than the context in another school? Uh, if I could come in on that, uh, Justin, I can see uh, if uh, CCA were to prescribe uh, the order in which uh, material was taught, uh, then it should be easier uh, for uh, someone to uh, find out what it is uh, they have missed. It would even allow for materials uh, to be made available on a Northern Ireland wide basis that you could try and find out roughly. Uh, what, what, what content would have been covered. And I do think there is an opportunity uh, to make available uh, material for uh, GCSE, AS and A level uh, across, across every school, uh, learning resources that anyone could then dip into uh, during a, a period that they're off. Okay, thanks, Justin. And uh, finally, following the algorithm debacle, do you have a sense of peace about how they might be employed in the current year? No, uh, and I, I don't. Sorry, I don't think anyone uh, is going to have. Um, I think we're still dealing with so many uh, unknowns, and we need to do everything possible to make sure we don't uh, have the same uh, issues this year. Yeah, 
And I, th I think that unions raised this very early. You know, unions raised this very early that they're concerned about the algorithm. So I think communication is key to this and transparency moving forward. No, we, we would have... Justin, let me just bring Simon in there as well. Go ahead, Simon. Uh, within, the, within the profession, we would have very, very limited uh, confidence. Um, that, you know, there's still a cloud hanging over the algorithm. Uh, it hasn't been published. A clear explanation of it hasn't been given. We're still dealing with two students that have lost out in university places, even though they were eventually awarded their, their centre assessed grades. Those children have been particularly disadvantaged. We are familiar with the Z score and the Z score that you used to, to calculate you know, a, a, a pupil that misses an exam. And my understanding is that that Z score will be used on a, on a wider, more whole scale basis. But again, there's not a clear understanding within the teaching profession of how that Z score works. And I think the, the cloud of um, Maybe secrecy is the wrong word, but the, the cloud of mystery uh, above the algorithms and the mathematical calculations have to be removed, because at the end of the day, we're the people that are going to have to explain to the pupils and the parents how this is going to work. And if we can explain how it's going to work in an understandable fashion, that, of course, is going to take away a lot of the apprehension and the fear. But I would still advocate for, for Year 14 pupils that the centres as grades that they currently hold at Year 13 are used as a major component in the calculation of their, of their Year 14. Okay. okay, Justin? Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Okay, Morris Bradley? Morris there? Yeah, he should be. Morris, if you, you might be on mute. Can you hear us okay? I, there you are. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for your, your presentation and your answers so far. Uh, I will try and be brief. Uh, I do share the concerns raised tonight today, uh, and the need to make sure that all people selective or non selective are given a level playing field going forward and equal opportunity. <coughs> However, only some teachers they're considering. Uh, redesignating some learning periods from other courses like arts, culture, music and sport to ensure valuable learning time to catch up uh, on lost educational time. Are you experiencing this? Okay, okay uh, Morris, I, I know that had uh, been uh, floated early on. Uh, however, the problem uh, that schools would have is, of course, uh, that the teachers of those other areas that aren't examined, uh, well, they couldn't necessarily then be redeployed into teaching the courses uh, that are examined. And uh, when it comes to uh, GCSE and A-level, uh, there actually isn't that much time in the curriculum that won't be subject to public examination anyway. Uh, children will have picked uh, subjects like art and even PE uh, as GCSE and A-level subjects. So I think uh, schools might refocus at key stage three and I think there will be a lot of debate around whether that uh, would be a good thing to do or not but in terms of GCSE and A-level I don't think there's any real additional flexibility uh, that, that's there. Okay, thanks very much for that. Kevin uh, had mentioned the, the need for monitoring uh, and I would agree that there's a need for monitoring uh, but is there a mechanism in place that would uh, allow you to feed that monitoring back to CCEA. Uh, are you referring to monitoring the, the situation yeah, yeah. In, in terms of uh, public health and so on? Yeah, That's what yeah. yeah very much more. It has to be a two way street. You know, there's, there's no point in, uh, say, simply <coughs> sending missives out to schools and saying do this and do that. It's the last thing that, 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 that teachers and centres want. Uh, we want uh, open forms of communication on a regular basis and that essentially, just to be clear, is what we are calling for. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the review or some mechanism or mechanisms by which we can review the situation on an ongoing basis uh, has to be established and it has to be a two-way street between the, the profession and the, the awarding bodies, in this case here. But also, you know, we, we have we have other awarding bodies, which I believe you're speaking to next week as well, so the same is relevant and true for them as well. Okay, thank you. One final uh, question, Chair, if it's all right with you. Yes, sure, okay, Morris, go ahead. Uh, it's uh, to Brona. Uh, she had expressed a uh, wish changes are not one off, but changes that would be carried forward to the future. Uh, and also alluded to a transition period. Is that something that she would envisage for the current pandemic, pandemic 
or do you feel a transition period should be a permanent change as well? Well, I think any changes that we're making at the moment should be permanent and forward thinking. And we shouldn't just see that we're getting a solution to this. You know, that we're, we're actually, you know, uh, changing our education system to adapt to what we feel may be better for our learners. I think we've got an opportunity here to really look at our education system in Northern Ireland and to really think about, you know, the, maybe the aspects of our curriculum that our young people are missing. And maybe it has been highlighted by this situation, you know, in terms of, um, you know, social skills, um, you know, even home economics, yeah. money matters, things like that. You know, alongside um, the other areas of the curriculum, I think we've got a real opportunity to shape our education system moving forward for our young people. In terms of the transition year, I think that young people, you know, whenever you think about GCSEs and why they were brought in, you know, to assess young people for leaving school, that's really not happening in lots of cases at the moment. And, uh, you know, we really need to look at that. And that transition year that I'm talking about would give young people, not, not all young people, you know, they wouldn't need it, but some young people, the security of staying linked with their school, staying linked with you know, the comfort of that, the supports of that, but also venturing out into experimenting with possible, you know, directions for their future plan. But, you know, they would have that and, and that comfort within their schools and all those relationships. Because for an awful lot of young people, especially our looked after children or disadvantaged children, to cut them from school at the age of 16 is a huge wrench for them. And lots of them fail to engage after that moving forward. So I think it would be a very good thing to consider. Yeah. And Chair, if I, if, I could, if I could just add to that, I think, you know, there, there are two issues at play. There's, there's the dealing with the here and the now. Uh, for, the, for the current cohort of year 12 and year 14 students, which has to be our immediate priority. But you know, we've talked about a root and branch review of education in Northern Ireland, and that's something that the, that the committee would, would advocate uh, moving forward. And I think under that umbrella, there really does need to be a, a substantial uh, review of how we assess our children and the purpose of that assessment. Uh, and just, you know, th this can be done. If I look at some of our students within, within my own school that were studying BTECs, uh, Pearson were happy to accept centre assessed grades, and I'm talking for year 11 students moving into year 12, they were happy to accept centre assessed grades both for uh, the coursework aspect of, of it, but also for the external examination part. Those students are back much happier, they know year 11 is behind them, they can now move on and focus in year 12, and for those students, the worry and the concern is just about a potential lockdown either locally or, or province-wide but at least they can set year 11 to the side. Yeah. And I think that's what needs to happen across all subjects, both at GCSE and at, at A-level. OK, Morris. Yeah, thanks for that, Simon. And I do think there is something that needs to be fed into the overall review of education. So thank you very much for that. Thank thanks, you. Me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Morris, and, and thanks all members. We are slightly over time, but only slightly, which is starkly different than normal. Um, would any of our witnesses, not, not to go over anything that has already been said, but is there anything any of you feel like you would have liked to have said that you didn't get to, that you'd like to make a point on very briefly? English and maths. Yep. English and maths, and the fact that you know, there is no uh, mitigation for those two subjects, and that's going to, that's going to affect every single pupil at GCSE level. Um, and I think that that has to be one of the biggest priorities uh, at, at GCSE. The original plans, actually, that SIA had advocated at the, at the end of the summer term, um, was, was that there were two options that basically the, the pupils would either sit one, um, one unit within MAS, and that the, the, the second was that they would sit both units, but the highest of one uh, would, would count. Uh, to give you, give you an, an anecdotal example, we have uh, some year 11s that are now in year 12s actually finished their GCSE course, um, but if, say they got a C and they wanted to improve that to a B or a B move into an A, under normal circumstances they repeat one unit or the option if they want to repeat two. Under the current, uh, under the current guidance they have to repeat both units mm -hmm. in order to get that grade uh, to, to move up and that's, that's, that's unacceptable. So I think ma maths and English most definitely need to be a priority. Quite considerable uh, airtime was given on local media to uh, the issue that um, students wouldn't be studying um, certain literature books. But what they failed to understand was those students in year 11, by and large, had already studied. They just weren't being assessed on it. 
Um, so, you know, we need to cut through the, 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 mis the misconceptions and actually get focused in on what the nuts and bolts and only see you and live practitioners yeah. are able to do that. Okay. okay. Any, um, any other witnesses? Yeah, final comment? I just yeah, wanted to quite quickly mention the idea of actually sitting practical exams and the thought that the potential to use not just schools for this, but public buildings or education authority buildings moving forward, you know, could open that out in terms of whatever public health guidance we're under at that time. But, you know, the idea that that would be a possibility, I think, would be worth looking at. Okay. Any other witnesses want to make a brief final comment? Yeah. Justin, yeah. The final comment uh, is just uh, see a need to act, act quickly and, and get this done and uh, keep uh, in regular contact with you so as to go on. Okay. Stephen, Kevin? Okay. Okay, thank you. Look, in, in summary, um, folks, thank you very much indeed for your invaluable evidence today. Um, I don't think it seems an exaggeration for me to conclude that the um, NITC has serious concerns that the current proposals for Curriculum and Assessment 2020-21 need urgent reworking in partnership with the teaching profession if negative impact on some pupils is to be avoided and that you are wholly committed to contributing to that urgent reworking. So that is what we will be raising with the Department of Education and SEA um, as urgently as we possibly can. Thank you for your, your contribution today. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, members, if I ask the clerk to summarise briefly any key actions um, or uh, further information that we need from that evidence session. So, Chairperson, I'd like to ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring members uh, back into the spotlight and um, just leave the department out, even though they're on the line um, just now. So, members, just to remind you, SEA will come next week. Um, they will take you through the feedback to the consultation, and uh, that will be make your mind up time um, for the committee then. The committee will have to decide what it thinks about the consultation. So, a lot of points which the, the chair has just um, specified um, just there. Uh, perhaps in the interim, the committee could write to SEA, just ask them to clarify on the use of the Z score, um, which uh, Mr. Mowbray mentioned there, because my understanding of that from the consultation was that was going to be quite straightforward. Um, also to ask them about the exam timetable. They do refer to it. They indicate they're going to have a compressed timetable ending on the 30th of June, but again, off call seems to be doing something different. And maybe to ask them to comment on the uh, suggested to a delay to key stage moves in the introduction of a transition year, because that's not in the consultation. So all those other things, I think, were in the um, written uh, papers that the committee received. So I would anticipate say it will have received that, and they will comment on that when they come. So what they'll do is they'll say, this is what everybody said, and they'll say, well, committee, what do you think? And hopefully they'll also give an indication of where they're going. Um, then the committee will then have to give its answer that day and uh, then they will write off to the minister with, here's what everybody said, here's what the committee said, here's what we suggest you do, minister. Um, additionally then, perhaps the committee might, um, well, we could write to NITC and ask them if they have issues around NISTRA and uh, C2K. Just members, no disrespect to NITC, we've written to them before and they don't answer because they're very busy, particularly this time of year, um, so there's difficulty getting responses to them. I would suggest to leave the other questions for the department to the department because they're on the line um, okay. next. Okay. If that's okay. Uh, members, can I just add on to that? And Clark, can I add on to that that we, we do just convey direct to the minister and say that the that one, two, three, four, five unions represented under the Northern Ireland Teacher Council have expressed serious concern with regards to the current proposal and requested urgent engagement with them. Um, in relation to coming up with a, a better approach. Perhaps also to ask in what way the School Restart Practitioners Group and Stakeholders Group is being used to inform Curriculum and Assessment 2020-21. There's no questions for the department now. <coughs> OK. Well, so, feel free to, for see you. Uh, well, I would think even... Uh, I would suggest, Chairperson, that you have um, officials on the line coming up next Ask put, them. Those, put those questions okay. to them. And if Good they job. don't give you a good answer, well then, that's a whole other thing. Okay, that's fair enough. 
Okay, Clark, do you need to uh, speak to the query from SIA? Just, just one other thing, members. At yeah. page 112 of your packs, uh, the committee wrote to SIA asking for a breakdown by named school of predicted grade against actual outcome mm -hmm. for the years 2017, 18 and 19. Um, so what we were trying to do was to find out um, how the standardised grades compared with what teachers asked for. Um, the SIA has written back to us asking us why we want the information. Well, that's the reason, and I've told them. I remember it's just content to leave it at that. Um, we could write back to them if you like. Um, the committee doesn't have to give its reasons, just so you're clear. You ask questions, they answer, and they don't get to say why. Um, they just answer your question. So if members are happy, we'll leave it at that and see uh, what answers we get. Yep. Why would Chairway would say and write back and ask why we were required. What do you think we needed for? I, I, I don't know, Chairperson. I thought the member, Mr. McCrossan, was actually pretty clear on the day because it was you that asked for this, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I thought it was it was very straightforward, and the committee had been very straightforward. So uh, yeah, so good question. Just, yeah, so so just to be clear, the, the information you're requesting is the a comparison of the centre assess grade with the SEA grade yeah. for um, for all schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that the, um, I think um, what I was going to do is have a bit of a look at it and see if, say, certain sectors say it was more inclined to believe what the um, teachers predicted. Um, maybe that was for some sectors other than others. You can guess which ones I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, and just we'll just see. We'll let, okay. let the science yeah. speak, let the, the numbers speak, and then we'll know. Uh, so we're maintaining the request for that information, Clark, is the conclusion? Yeah. If the committee yeah. tells me so, yes. Members yeah. agreed? Yeah. Agreed. agreed. Okay. Just on, just on that, just to add to my deep discontent with the in terms of that reply that we've received, uh, we think that beyond all realms of questioning and the accountability, it's just deeply uh, uh, frustrating to, to be blunt about it. Particularly when you consider what's happened in other parts of the UK in terms of those who are responsible for, the, for overseeing this chaos. And, the questions are continuing to be relevant. I, I'm really, really concerned about the leadership of SEA. They're very blunt about it. And obviously um, they're, they're, they're with us next week. Daniel, yep. Okay. Uh, just, just, just there was another point, Chair, uh, before we go into the next yep. session. Go ahead. Over the course of the last number of weeks, we've had the Deputy Permanent Secretary for the Department with us. Uh, and he too has presented very unprepared for the line of questioning and evidence giving that we require as a committee. Uh, I hope we've got it completed today because if it is, we need to be asking questions as well as to whether he is prepared or not for the questions that we're asking given the critical um, uh, evidence that we require uh, to support schools and the other emerging issues in education. Okay, uh, Robin, you want to come sure. in? Rob, sorry, Robin Newton want to come in, then Justin bring you in after that. Yeah, just Chair, on the page 112, the CL letter. Uh, do we now need to formally write to Peter to answer their query about the why? Kindly ask for what purpose the committee requires the data. I've emailed them, so I've spoken to them. It's just I was I'm I think we've answered that, and I just they wouldn't want to get into a situation where you know stakeholders question the committee about where you want stuff, no. and then the committee goes off and answers. We don't have to do that. I just no. would like, I think I have the committee's yeah. agreement to, to yeah, not yeah. do that. Okay, that's, that's okay. No, I'm content with that, Chair. Okay, thanks, Rob. Justin, did you want to come in briefly? Yeah. Guys, guys, I'm in gobsmacked by that now. What the hell is going on? How the hell can an organisation that, that's supposed to be looking after the welfare of our kids, who are supposed to be doing, looking after examinations for our kids, now come back to us and ask us why we're looking for information? What the hell is going on? That is incredible. Is the press since this? Has that happened before? What the hell is going on? Okay, understand the frustrations. Um, I don't normally need to ask us to keep our language parliamentary, but um, <laughs> you won't mind me doing that, Justice. I, 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 not to take away from your level of frustration, I, I appreciate it. Um, and, I, and I think that is why we are returning to redouble our request for that information. <laughs> Obviously, as I we said, well. sure. we shouldn't have to ask questions. They shouldn't, under no circumstances should an organisation come back and ask us why do we want the information. Okay, point made. Any other members? Content for us to move to next item. Okay, members, our next agenda item then is agenda item six, our Department of Education and Education Authority uh, oral evidence session on school restart. Can I uh, ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members who are not in room 29 from Spotlight? 
and to add officials who have joined us via Starleaf and welcome John Smith, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Education, Adrian Murphy, Head of Area Planning, North Region, Department of Education, Tina Dempster, Head of Child Care Strategy Team in the Department of Education, Michelle Corky, Director of Education at the Education Authority, and Dale Hanna, Acting Director of Operations and Estate at the Education Authority. Can I advise witnesses that proceedings will be reported by Hansard and refer members to their packs, which includes a cover note from the clerk at page 114, correspondence from the department on school restart at page 125, DE guidance on restart at page 141, and at page 221, departmental correspondence, which was sent to every school last week. In tabled items is the latest relevant outgoing correspondence from the committee and a paper from the department updating on childcare and the Department of Education Education Authority weekly update report on school restart. By way of welcome to our witnesses, um, can I say that the committee has sought urgent clarity on a number of issues. Firstly, the numbers of medically vulnerable children requiring a risk assessment and the progress that has been made in this regard, including the provision of out-of-school or blended learning support. Secondly, clarification on pupil and teaching and non-teaching staff attendance stroke absentee levels in schools since the 31st of August 2020. And thirdly, the provision of a simple mechanism by which schools can avail of the additional financial support for COVID costs, such as cleaning, additional teaching, uh, human resources, and a timescale by which this will be put in place and explained to schools. Can I ask officials to ensure that you answer these three questions in the course of your opening remarks and also invite you to speak to the child care update? At that note, can I hand over to John to start your opening remarks? Thank you, Chair. Good, uh, good morning. Um, <coughs> we've provided you with the, uh, the weekly uh, update report on, on progress. In terms of the correspondence uh, that you just alluded to there, Chair, I can give you an overview uh, of, of some of those topics, but I understand the, 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 uh, the written replies are due with you in the next few days, uh, so you'll receive the official responses to that in due course. The clerk had indicated that uh, post-primary post transfer uh, arrangements are due for a separate evidence session later in this month, so we haven't given uh, a detailed uh, update on those arrangements in the report today. So, in terms of uh, childcare uh, theme, uh, Tina is here, as, and as you said, uh, that you, you've received uh, a paper on the childcare arrangements on that. I'll just briefly summarise some of the key points and then later on Tina will be able to answer any detailed questions. But as of, as of today, uh, approximately 7.5 million of the recovery support fund has been allocated to providers and that's about 73% of the overall budget. As I said last week, uh, we're considering a joint proposal from the Childminders Association for additional funding to be allocated potentially for the July and August period. And looking ahead, we continue to consult with the Child Care Reference Group about what support, if any, might be required by the sector from September onwards. In terms of curriculum assessment and remote learning, you'll be aware that SEERS consultation and qualification exams launched on the 24th of August. Around 3,500 responses have been received to date and that consultation is due to close on the 7th of September. Around 5,500 mobile devices have been delivered to schools as part of the scheme that we launched earlier on uh, this year and the remaining devices are due to be delivered out at around 1,000 a week through September. In addition, the Education Authority has bought 8,300 Wi-Fi vouchers to help disadvantaged children um, and they will provide up to eight months of free internet access. Nearly 600 requests were received for those in June and July 
and a further request for 1,413 vouchers were received in August and they're being processed. In addition to that, an initial quantity of 2,500 MiFi devices, which work for up to eight months, have been requested. Uh, 620 devices have been received to date. <coughs> Turning to the Engage programme, uh, we've continued to design that programme, working with the practitioners group and the trade union sides on the detail. And a detailed guidance document should be issued to schools in September. We're working on and developing an Engage Planner to help the operation of the scheme. And what that will do is use the department and the employing authorities will use that to monitor uptake of the programme by the schools and how those resources are being utilised. And we also plan to create a strategic oversight group to oversee how the programme is unfolding this year. Um, and that will comprise representatives from the department, the employing authorities and teachers. And the budget for that scheme this year uh, in financial year 2020-21 is 11.2 million. In terms of COVID-19 testing, any decision to deploy mobile testing to a school will be taken in conjunction with the PHA and they, they will take that decision based upon the profile of cases identified through the Track and Trace programme. More recently, the departments agreed to take part in the National Testing Initiative, which is being run by the healthcare services in, in England, and that will provide every school, um, including plus FE colleges, with 10 individual home care testing kits. And this is for the scenario where a parent or a carer is unable to secure a test for a child who has COVID symptoms. Um, one of those kits can be given to the parent or carer to take home. The tests won't be undertaken by the school or the college, they'll be done at home. We're also aware that recently a number of erroneous emails had issued to the schools on behalf of the, or, or from the uh, Department of Health and Social Care in England and we're working closely with that organisation to make sure that no further emails are sent out. On operational matters, in terms of catering, um, on the 1st of September all school kitchens reopened as planned and on the 2nd of September the free school meal box service commenced and that's providing food parcels to a number of children that are entitled to free meals but who are unable to attend school due to COVID restrictions. And as I said, that, that commenced on the 2nd of September. The EA are keeping close to the school principals on this, and there was a pulse check done on the 4th of September to find out how, uh, how that's going in practice, so we can uh, take feedback and refine as necessary. So far, the feedback from that pulse check was positive. In terms of school transport, um, EA transport services resumed as normal in full with minimal disruption to services beyond the normal levels of tolerance. The EA have put in some mitigation measures um, in, in the context of COVID. Over 700 hand sanitizer units have been installed on the EA operational fleet. PPE has been distributed to drivers and escorts and that's masks, visors, hand sanitizer, gloves, and aprons and cleaning products uh, as appropriate. Uh, the EA arranged additional PPE collection points for last Friday following the trade union feedback uh, that the PPE had not been sufficient and so far take up of that has been low. An additional measure that's been put in place um, which exceeds the PHA advice is that driver screens are being put up in the EA operational fleet <coughs> and that's starting with the smaller vehicles in the first instance. Um, a plethora of guidance has issued um, for parents, pupils, schools, special schools, private operators and drivers. And we continue to reiterate the message that uh, face coverings are strongly recommended to be worn on all school transport where the pupil is able to do so. In terms of cleaning, <coughs> the EA's cleaning service is now fully operational and since the outbreak of COVID, 
the support services have quickly evolved to also provide help and support and resources to all schools throughout Northern Ireland. The EA is currently establishing COVID response teams which will be strategically located and will use specialist sanitising machines which the EA has bought for this purpose. In terms of PPE, uh, 10 tenders for PPE are already underway or are currently being specified. Emergency packs of cleaning materials and PPE were put together and they've been available either for delivery to schools or for schools to pick up at the EA's emergency distribution centre or the EA's headquarter buildings. And there are three packs that are available to schools at this time. In terms of the new school day guidance, as I said last week, version 2 was issued on the 13th of September. The EA has set up a helpline to deal with queries and provide advice, and there's a separate dedicated email inbox that's monitored 24 hours a day for any suspected or confirmed cases. Uh, I continue to stress that for schools, their link officers are their first point of contact, and PHA should only be contacted to deal with uh, confirmed positive cases and the contract tracing service will kick in at that point. We did issue uh, detailed flowcharts late last week to schools because there was uh, feedback in terms of uh, from schools as to how best to manage uh, confirmed or suspected cases within the school environment. So we took the new school day guidance and on the basis of that work with the PHA to produce detailed flowcharts that set out in some detail the steps that school need to take with contact telephone numbers uh, as well. Um, alongside that, we, uh, we sent an email to schools just to clarify in terms of the COVID-19 symptoms and the difference between those and the normal uh, coughs and colds that, that appear at this time of year uh, and, and stressing that um, Schools shouldn't be advising pupils not to come to school if they've got uh, a cough, cold or a runny nose. And tests should only be sought if pupils have COVID-19 symptoms. In terms of the youth service, the EA is working with key stakeholders, including young people, for the safe restart of generic youth services in October. And this will take place on a phased basis. The youth services published extensive guidance on Youth Restart, all of which is available on the EA's website. Turning to communications and engagement, um, I think as we noted last week, following advice from the CMO and the Chief Scientific Advisor, we've recommended that pupils and school staff should wear face coverings in corridors and other communal areas for post-primary schools when schools return uh, full time. And as I said earlier on, we provided more guidance and detailed flowcharts to schools last week, uh, covering what they should do in the case of a suspected or confirmed COVID case. And finally, at the back of the report, we published some data metrics. Um, we're now collecting data again. Uh, we'll continue to develop this as, as, the, as the data systems stand up. The key headlines, though, uh, from your pack, in the, in the week commencing the 24th of August, there was an overall attendance rate in schools of 95% across all schools in Northern Ireland, which is slightly lower, uh, 1.2 percentage points lower than it was in September 19. So the message from that is that at least in week one, school attendance was bearing up well. Childcare settings, uh, in terms of the settings that were open on the 4th of September, 79% of all childcare settings were open or had been approved by the Health and Social Care Trusts to open as soon as possible, and that includes 77% of child minors. So Chair, that's just a brief overview of the report that we sent to you uh, yesterday, I think. Um, I'll stop there and take any questions that you or members might have. Thank you. Thanks, John. Obviously, in terms of your data for school attendance, week one was largely year seven, uh, year 12, and year 14, um, with some additions. 
Uh, the last week would have been the first week of a, a, a full return to school. Um, what is yeah. the what are what is the attendance for that week? I don't have the the data for that yet, uh, Chair. We'll be able to provide that for you next week. Didn't think we were going to ask that. Okay, okay, Adrian. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, do have that. I should say latest attendance from the schools that complete the Sims database are. Post-primary, 92.8%. Sorry, primary, 92.8%. Post-primary sector, 94.6%. In the special school, 87.2%. Uh, EOTUS, 68.6%. And that gives an overall attendance figure of 93.6%. That includes the special and EOTUS sector. Um, and is that from the, in was it the 1st of September? The f Monday that was Monday, the first of September, I think. Last is that last week's figures, John? Yeah. Yeah, that's the first of September. Yep. Um, Seven hundred and nine schools responded, uh, and in terms of the attendance rate for teaching staff, it was ninety six point three percent and ninety seven point three percent for non teaching staff. Okay, and how, how do those figures for uh, EOTA Special School? primary and post-primary compared to other years? Now, that, I don't believe I have those figures, uh, okay. Chair. Uh, I'll need to come back to you on that. Okay, I presume the department is, is monitoring attendance in comparison to other years? It, it we'd wish to know how attendance is going? Yes, we are monitoring it, Chair. Uh, we'll be able to provide comparative stats for previous years if we have them, but we are monitoring on a weekly basis going forward. Okay. Uh, just to add, um, <clears throat> uh, we're, the comparison at this point is most useful to compare against some of the other European countries who have come back to, have uh, brought their education systems back, so some of the most successful ones have been uh, what we're aware of in Germany and in Holland. They started with something like 80 to 85 percent attendance, even in the smaller groups and tranches of people that they had. So, getting anywhere above 90 percent is being seen as a, an extremely positive result, and uh, shows a great deal of faith in our parents that the system that we've developed is safe and secure. Okay, and in terms of the uh, question with regards to how many extremely clinically vulnerable ch uh, pupils. Uh, or pupils with extremely clinically vulnerable family members are in the system and awaiting risk assessment. Can you provide us an update in relation to that? <clears throat> Chair, I can, I can take that. I can't give you the actual number of children, but what I can say, advise is that we're currently working with um, a, a range of stakeholders around each of those cases to try and make sure that we get the children back into school as quickly as possible. I'll, I'll add to that, if you don't mind, Chair. Um, in terms of that group of children, uh, there are a very small group of children who would be going to, the, particularly to, uh, your challenging uh, uh, symptoms or diseases that would normally be returning to special schools, and they will be going through that transition process with that level of risk assessment and engagement with health professionals and, and education professionals. Our latest advice from the Public Health Agency is that risk assessments for other individuals, other pupils who were vulnerable or extremely clinically vulnerable, is that that is no longer required and we're currently working on redrafting that. Their advice is that all children in that sector, other than the most extremely clinically vulnerable, who have been advised by a hospital consultant or where they're not in the care of a hospital consultant directly by their GP, should be at school. Okay. Um is the department monitoring the levels of COVID infection amongst uh, school pupils and staff? Again, I, I can give you some, some data on that. Um, we, we know how many schools have been in contact with us and contact with the education authority um, uh, reflecting a number of positive, where they have had positive cases reported. Uh, Unfortunately, the department itself does not hold data on the actual number of positive cases. That data is held by the PHA. They hold all the testing data and the information in terms of whatever pupils or contacts of pupils then can, can, uh, would 
uh, be confirmed as a positive case. All we know at the point when we are uh, managing this system is that we have been contacted by uh, a number of parents uh, and a number of schools where we have uh, closures. And as I understand that yesterday, that was 88 reports of uh, into schools of a positive case in 64 educational settings. After that, we don't know the number of pupils and we will not be in a position ever to know the number of pupils who have positive tests. Okay, so just just to be just to make sure I'm clear, Adrian, you're you're saying that there are 64 educational settings in Northern Ireland that have positive COVID cases. Uh, that's our understanding based on the latest information from uh, the reports from uh, teachers coming into the EA. Okay, and so you need to be mindful that that's out of 1,300 uh, educational establishments. So 64 is actually a very very small proportion. Okay, but. I, I presume that the Department of Education will want live data with regards to the positive COVID cases in your schools? We won't ever know that because that, that data is personal to the individual. So it's only to the extent that a parent or a member of staff actually advises the school that they've had a parent that had a positive test that you become aware of that. There is no capacity for the test and trace system to share that data with with us, that's personal to the individual. Let me, uh, I could just come in as well there, Chair. Sure. We are working on specifying the data that we need to collect for the purposes of managing the education system. So, for example, we know at the moment uh, how many education settings are reporting positive cases. As Adrian said, um, we're, not, uh, we're not focused on collecting individual names and numbers but we are interested in the management information that we need to help how we run the system so yeah, that might be yeah i, I think uh, that's what i was asking John, I, don't, I don't think i was asking for individual names of, of but we're working on that at the yeah. moment okay um yeah i mean i mean if pha holds information about positive cases at educational settings i presume you're asking for that information. I'm not suggesting that you're asking for individual names, nor am I, but I presume you're asking PHA to share information with you with regards to positive cases in educational settings. Well, we're also getting that through from the Education Authority. So whether it comes through from the EA or the PHA, we are receiving that data. So we do know uh, which educational settings what uh, you know which schools they are we can map that by geographical location by phase we're also able to know uh, what management action those schools have actually needed to take in terms of uh, you know whether it's year groups or, or, or um, individual classes that have been affected and that's the kind of information that we need and that's the kind of info that, that, we're, that we're currently okay. getting I'm out of my self-enforced time, but very uh, briefly in closing, um, we, we engaged in our last session with the Northern Ireland Teaching Council, approximately five unions, and there was a very clear message um, that the, of, of serious concern with regards to the current proposal for curriculum and assessment 2020-21, um, and a very clear commitment to uh, have improved and intense engagement with SIA uh, on the behalf of the teaching profession um, in order to avoid negative impact on pupils. Can I, can I ask why the School Restart Practitioners Group and the School Restart Stakeholder Forum has not been employed um, in co-production with SIA of the proposals for the curriculum and assessment 2020-21? Well, Chair, the focus of that group, as far as, as far as I understand it, was on production of the new school day guidance. Uh, to what extent they may or may not have been involved in the in the curriculum is something that we need to get back to you on. Um, I can get I back. Our, our I focus think I can get back to you on it today. I think it, if I don't think they were, um, and that's why I'm asking if if that was a constructive format for production of the school restart guidance. <laughs> Is that not also a constructive format that could be used to ensure that the curriculum and assessment 2020-21 approach 
that is finalised has has been designed in co-production with um, with teaching practitioners. Well, I don't think that practitioners group was ever intended to to address the uh, the curriculum uh, and the examination aspect of it, Chair. But surely, um, <clears throat> I'm sure my colleagues were listening to the earlier session, and that's something that we could look at going forward uh, and, and take that on board as necessary. I mean, the Northern Ireland Teaching Council is telling you today these proposals will have a negative impact on pupils in Northern Ireland. That's why I'm asking the question. Um, is there a, a format that could facilitate urgent engagement with the teaching profession on proposals that they are saying will have a negative impact on pupils? I, I presume that would be pretty concerning to you. I need to move on and bring in uh, Karen Mullen, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, everybody, for attending this morning again. And I just want to pick up on the point that Chris has finished off there on relation to the unions. Um, uh, I've been made aware that the latest guidance went out late on Friday night, and they had a, they were told they respond on Monday morning. So again, it's consistent with the message that we're getting. Co-design and uh, consultation is not happening across the board. So I'm just going to make a point on that one. In relation to uh, the, the symptoms, the COVID symptoms, um, John, you gave the update in relation to an email going to principals. What I was asking last week was also was that um, graphic to be done and sent out to parents. Um, I'm not sure if that has been actioned. OK, yes, Karen, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we have a leaflet which is currently uh, just going through final desktop publishing, for want of a better word, uh, that we aim to issue through schools uh, aimed at all parents and carers within the next day or so. Um, and that will be available uh, through our own website as well. And that leaflet will cover two things. Um, first of all, the difference between COVID symptoms and non-COVID symptoms and what parents and carers should do in that regard. Yeah. But also, it puts uh, on paper a series of scenarios that are intended to help parents uh, to know what to do when, for example, when my child has COVID-like symptoms, or if what to do if someone in my house has COVID-like symptoms, what to do if my child has been in contact with a contact of a contact of someone who has tested positive for COVID. And there are half a dozen scenarios or so yep. on there in a, in a helpful one page fact sheet with, uh, with, with all the details of what parents need to do and the circumstances in which their children can return to school. Um, hopefully that will provide some good um, clarification in terms, of, uh, in terms of clearing that up. Um, yep, that would be great, George. Just your first point. That, yeah. that you made about um, sure. Sure. Uh, can I, can I come in on guidance that? issuing on Friday night. Yeah, just one uh, second, just one second, if I could come in there. Um, Robin Newton just wants to ask a, a supplementary before <coughs> on this this particular matter before I bring you back in, John, and then I'll come back to. Um, Thank you, Chair, and thank you, John. Uh, I, I had uh, I've been scrolling through the information you've provided, John. And I've had a parent in the office yesterday whose child was sent home and two other children uh, of the same family attending school were sent home because they had cold-like symptoms mm -hmm. as opposed to COVID-19 type symptoms. Yeah. Uh, I wonder would you just comment on the role mm -hmm. of the principal or the school when, uh, in this case it's primary, and uh, second level education, uh, where they attend with a cold as opposed to COVID-19 symptoms? Yeah, um, we, we, we've clarified this and worked closely with the PHA on this. Uh, Robin, you know, kids are going to get colds this time of year, runny noses, head colds. That is not COVID-19. Um, if a child has a cold and they don't have COVID-19 symptoms, if they're fit and able to, to go to school, they should go to school. Schools should not be sending children home if they don't have COVID symptoms. They shouldn't be um, asking for 
uh, COVID-19 tests if they don't have COVID-19 symptoms? Can I just share, share uh, I, I have to say I would have shared the concerns of the parent that three children in her family were now home from school. Um, and I think maybe there does need to be, John, some clarification around that direct to the schools, perhaps more so than I have seen, certainly, within the guidance that you've provided. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Thank bring, yeah. that, Thanks, Rob. That's, bring, John, just bring uh, Karen back in there as well. The guidance we, we put out on, on Friday. Robin. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, John. Karen. Yeah, thank you. And that, from uh, Robin's point, just moves on to earlier in relation to testing. Um, in my own city, we have a primary school. We've had a number of positive cases. It is now um, going through the school in relation to class by class getting tested. We're seeing major, major pressure. We're seeing uh, children being sent for tests, not being able to... Children have been sent home. Um, uh, but don't believe... You know, as well, it's probably about it being cautious, as Robin has highlighted. We highlighted it last week in the, the committee. So just in relation to the test and mobile testing unit, John, you were saying it's up to the PHA, but in a case like that, can the Education Authority not request that the mobile unit go to this school? Um, we have Irit very concerned and worried parents on the phone. They're not able to get testing. I know that we were out on this yesterday. Some people are being given a test in Scotland and England and other places. But in this incidence, rather than leaving it up to the PHA, can the Education Authority request that the mobile unit be attend a school and carry out, out those tests? I'm happy to come in and, um, PHA will lead in terms of where the risk is. Uh, the issue is that uh, when schools are telling people to go home and self-isolate and wait to be contacted by, by PHA, well, we understand, and I as a parent would fully be behind it, you would want to then get a test for your child. PHA will not test a child unless you have definite COVID-19 symptoms. You're, you've been told to protectively self-isolate, and if, in an example of a class being sent home, one child is symptomatic or one child has had a, a positive case and all 29 others go looking for a test. We know that the results, uh, the negative result rate is something like about 98% on all tests. But you've sent 29 children for a test that's actually unnecessary. So testing is only required Adrian, when you're symptomatic. Sorry, and I don't PHA will not do those tests. I am talking about children. I am talking about children who are symptomatic. These children are there seems to be a high proportion of children that are symptomatic and PHA has agreed to carry out the test. I know the difference, I'm not asking for all the school. There's a particular yep. issue in this school. It's gonna be an issue throughout a lot of schools in the north. So I'm just asking the question where there is an issue, a high proportion of children who are symptomatic can AA request for the mobile testing because we're seeing the pressures across the system in terms of the wider community in testing. Um, we don't want to see you know, lockdowns of schools unnecessarily. So uh, can that request come from yourselves? Um, I, I, I think it goes back to the sort of point, it's, it's EA for, for EA could, could request that. Yeah. Uh, EHA will manage that risk because they're, they're the only ones who, knows the, who know the wider context in the sort of local society in terms of what what other tests are being required and where the number of sort of in inverted commas hotspots are. Um, there is limited testing capacity and they will want to manage that. But yeah. the advice clearly is uh, you self-isolate and you can get a test. Whether the test happens two days or five days afterward, you'll know then that you've got it. Uh, I appreciate it. Again, as I said, as a parent, I would want to know as quickly as possible. But if the testing system is flooded with people coming through, um, in this case, you're talking about something which is very clearly a, a, a range of symptomatic cases, but actually what we're getting from a lot of other schools is a result of one individual who may have upwards of 100 other children being uh, yeah. protectively isolated and then parents looking for tests. And that's yeah. flooding the capacity of the system. And that's flooding it not just in Northern Ireland, but across both in the Republic of Ireland, they're facing the same issue as schools have gone back. And Scotland faced it three weeks ago, and yeah. England are facing yeah. it at the very, this particular moment as well. It's an issue about uh, the capacity of the system to deal with that flood. Yep, yeah, yeah, totally get that. That's why I was sort of asking maybe in terms of if we take some of the 
school children out of the system and leave for the community, but I've made my point. Um, and also, yeah, could I, could I just, I, I, could I just John, come in there, uh, Karen? As I, as very, I said briefly, earlier on, very briefly, John, yeah. School, schools are participating in the National Testing Initiative. They'll all get 10 home testing kits. So yeah. if the parent is stuck to source the test through uh, the, the usual channels, yeah. that route is available to yeah. them. Of course, I don't you know, advise that. working every day with the PHA, they will be the, the, the organisation that will, will that will decide on whether the, the current testing capacity uh, regionally is, is meeting demand and if there's a need for, for other interventions such as mobile uh, mobile units then that's something that will be considered but will be guided by them in that regard. Thank you, and I suppose just my final point on it, and following on from the chair as well, I would have thought it would have been mandatory for a principal to report through a positive test in their school, but um, we had went over that, and my time's very short, so I want to move on to some of my other um, issues. I welcome, um, I thank uh, Dale and the team in taking on the concerns in relation to transport last week and stepping in. I also welcome the department's work on devices and Wi-Fi vouchers, um, uh, we had obviously been in contact with for a long time, so it's very welcome. But I wanted to ask, what was the last date that the guidance or direction was updated in relation to schools around um, blended online learning and what training has happened or is happening for teachers? Any, any views on that one? Karen, could you repeat that one for me? Yeah, um, what, was the, what was the date of the, the last updated guidance or directed direction given to school leaders in relation to blended learning or, or remote learning? And what training has happened for staff or is happening? Well, in terms of when, when we last put guidance out, I, I don't have a precise date. Um, I do know that we did issue a circular in August around uh, blended learning and how schools can prepare their curriculum for and adapt it for 2021. But I don't have the precise uh, date to hand on that one, Karen. Right. Um, we just had an update from the unions this morning. So it may have been in June, the 6th of June, I think they were saying. So it might be something that you, you may want to look at and, and update and come back and give us a bit of detail. In relation to school meals, I've heard the update and read it and asked the question last week. <coughs> what date is hot school meals going to be provided? Um, or can you give us a timeline in relation to moving towards that, Dale? Yeah, Karen, um, obviously what has happened is we've been working with each of the schools on an individual basis about um, what they want to do and what they bring in. And I, I think principals have, on, in general, been quite cautious. So. Um, in terms of last week, there, there was quite a high uptake in terms of packed lunches. But what I can say is we, we have written out to school leaders this week now, encouraging them to take up uh, hot meals. And we're working with schools on an individual basis to try and encourage that. So we have limited hot meal uh, menu choices available. So we're working hard now with school leaders to, to make sure that they can put that in place in their individual schools. Thank you, Dale. It's important that we get that in place. Obviously, it's following the safety of staff and, and all of that there. But as we know, these children, it may be their only hot meal they get. Um, so it's, it's important we move towards that. Tina, just in relation to childcare, um, you may not be able to answer, but I've written to the minister um, and I will be following up with him. Community crash and community facilities um, have not been able to apply through the restart recovery. Um, they have... Uh, they're, they, they don't meet the criteria. Many of these organisations, as you know, they provide vital services within many of most of the disadvantaged communities that we have with little funding um, and little or no income to be able to provide uh, all of the PPE and the safe return that all the other facilities had. Um, I believe that this was uh, overlooked. Um, is this something that yourself and the department and the minister can re-look at and uh, see if they can avail of some of the funding? Yes, Karen, we, we did look at the, the crash issue. I mean, there's many types of registration um, within um, the child care sector. Crashes are, are time limited and most of them run at less than four hours. 
Um, over a third of them are through sure starts who continue to receive their funding. Some of the creches are through the women's centres which continue to receive funding from the Department for Communities um, and some of them are privately run and they would be in the like of gyms and Ikea and stuff. When we looked at the recovery fund, the purpose of the recovery fund was to enable parents to go back to work in line with the executive recovery planning. Um, the view at that stage was that creches were for time limited activities. And I, there's about 81 creches that um, we have been told from the Department of Health Registration um, database. So, but yes, we, we can look at it um, yeah. and, and yeah. we're aware of, of your correspondence, but yeah. they, they weren't, we did look at them, but for yeah. the purpose of the recovery fund in, ter in terms of the time of the limited amount of money available and the priority in order to align with the executive recovery planning and get people back to work, crashes at that stage were not yeah. for that purpose. They were for other very short term time limited purposes. But yes, we're, we are happy to relook at and uh, we're aware of your correspondence. Need, need to move us all, Karen, Thanks, yeah. Tina, because it's, it's community facilities more than crashes. It's not IKEA crashes. And two that I'm talking about are not sure start are in two of the most disadvantaged communities in, in my constituency, so, and they don't receive, they're not sure start dealer. Um, just the last point here. Very um, brief, um, yep, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Just wanted to make a point, and this is a point. The principal support that you are telling us is not consistent with what we're hearing on the ground, and I don't know about all our members, but from the committee meeting last week, I've been inundated with principals in relation to the lack of support. The helpline isn't cutting it, um, uh, and the link officer, there's just gaps there. So it's a point that you need to pick it up, you need to re-engage with the principals and support them properly, and school leaders are still waiting to receive their time budgets from the Education Authority, but I have wrote to the Minister and all of that. Thank you. Okay, Minister. thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Thank you, Chair, and uh, again, welcome, John, uh, and indeed your, your team. Uh, thank you. I have to say the, the uh, figures that you uh, put out regarding uh, a test are, I suppose, very impressive, uh, and indeed uh, would indicate uh, parent confidence uh, that uh, it is safe for the children to return to, to school and indeed speak well for for the, the future. I have uh, Chair's just left the room. I was going to ask permission to ask a number of questions, Chair. Uh, uh, but I will, uh, maybe in, uh, they're, they're relatively short and focused questions, so perhaps could I ask about the the, 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 the potential of the transfer uh, of uh, pupils to do A level now, since there were the uh, successfully enhanced grades uh, where pupils may have well, up to stay on, and what would that impact be on the school budget for, for uh, the, the addition of pupils? Um, can I ask also about the school uh, transport situation and? your observations about both the school transport and indeed the use of public transport for uh, toing and froing to, to school, and your observations around how well that, that is, is working. I know that uh, we have raised this point several times uh, about the at-risk children who are returning to school, and we know that there are over around 2,000 at-risk children in Northern Ireland. I wonder, have you any uh, indication of how many of those children have returned to school uh, and the success? And is there an engagement with the health authority uh, on, on those children returning to school? That, that's my list. Okay, Robin. <coughs> um, in terms of the budget, uh, pupils returning to school, that the, 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 the budget is allocated through the common funding formula. The vast majority of that goes through on the basis of uh, pupil numbers, uh, on the basis of the annual school census. So uh, as, as those pupils going back into school feed into the, the census data, that will uh, have its implications through in terms of school delegated budgets. 
Dale, do you yeah. want to pick up on the transport point? Yeah, Robin, I mean, um, what I would say is I, I, I think we've had a really successful return to the school transport system. Um, the network is coping well. Um, it's being delivered within normal tolerances. We accept that there will be some bumps along the road in terms of some particular routes or particular pupils, but given that we've managed to stand the transport system back up again, I think that has been very successful. I would have to acknowledge that um, the drivers, both um, our own drivers, and the services at TransLink, and the private operators that support us, I think they've been brilliant and they've worked really hard, and I want to acknowledge their efforts. And um, We've had really positive engagement with our trade union colleagues as well, and that has helped us to stand that back up again and be successful. Um, and the EA is working really closely with TransLink to um, manage the network and make sure that we deal with any issues on an ongoing basis. So um, compared to any other September, um, the transport system is, is operating um, very much like any other year. So I, I, I'm satisfied that we've done a relatively good job around that. Thanks, Dale. Um, Robin, just in, in terms of your last point about at-risk children, <coughs> all the EA services that existed before uh, in respect of, of those children and in respect of the Department of Health uh, are up and running again. Uh, obviously, COVID's created a whole different dimension to that, um, and I'm sure as, as, as schools return, uh, we'll need to work through what the implications are of that. In terms of pupils' emotional health and well-being, and as you know, we're working to finalise the framework for um, the emotional health and well-being by uh, December this year. Schools are provided already with a number of resources around that um, through the uh, school development service and the, uh, the, the portal, um, particularly around bereavement and loss, critical incident response, children looked after and nurture and all of these are informed by trauma-informed practice. Can I just ask John, do you know of, of the children, at-risk children, whether or not the attendance of them has been as isn't there. it should be? Any um, indication that they are not attending or hard to get back to school? Well, I think, Robin, the, the figures that we gave earlier uh, and the, the, the overall figure we have, um, we do know that uh, there was 93.6% yeah. attendance last week, including special and EOTIS settings. Uh, in EOTIS, that was 68.6%. I don't have a breakdown of the okay. particular cohort of, uh, of looked after children uh, at this stage, no. Okay, okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. I'm going to bring uh, Daniel McCrossan in. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, uh, to our guests this week again. Uh, there's a number of pressing issues. Just to follow up on a point that Robin Newton had raised there in relation to the allocation uh, for uh, numbers in schools, that uh, John answered it. John, you were slightly wrong in that. Uh, the step amount uh, allocated to schools for uh, children is the same, but the actual number in schools as of next year is going to be higher, given that there's going to be a larger number of young people doing A level, AS levels, uh, because the grades are higher this year, would mean that they would have got in school. So th there will be less per head uh, per school. Uh, I think that needs to be clarified. Just in relation to the question uh, that I want to raise, one in particular is in relation to uh, child, the child care recovery scheme intended to be allocated £10.5 million. Uh, has this uh, funding now all been uh, distributed? Uh, and I also note that uh, the Union Unite wrote to the Department of Education in July complaining bitterly that the allocation for registered childminders was woefully inadequate and grossly unfair. They predicted that many childminders would now leave the sector, which I believe to be accurate. Did, you meet, uh, did the Department meet with Unite to resolve the problem or how was it addressed? And does the minister, does the department have any further uh, plans for uh, childminders? It appears that the administration of the scheme, which is shocking, this figure is shocking. Really. The administration of the scheme over two months cost one hundred and seventy-six thousand pounds, which is eighty-eight thousand pounds per month. They allocate these funds. 
Do you believe, John, that this is value for money? It's a colossal sum for the administration or distribution of money to these sectors. Do you believe that the eighty thousand per month is value for money in total one hundred seventy six thousand pounds? Okay, Daniel, a few points there, and Tina might come in uh, as well with the detail. Look, as of as of today, seventy three percent of that budget has been allocated out. That's seven point five million, um, and yeah. We, we, we know that the Childminders Association uh, have some issues with the amount of money that they're getting. Uh, the, that association and UNITE met with the Minister and we're currently considering a proposal from both those organisations over additional funding to be allocated for July and September. Um, do I believe that the, uh, the, the, the money that we've paid to administer the scheme is value for money? Well. In terms of value for money, it's, it's been effective. The, the money's been distributed quickly and in a timely way. The take of that scheme has been good. Uh, and ultimately, we've paid to, to receive a service and it appears to be working. And Tina, um, yeah. if you've got anything to add on that. Yeah, no, I would just concur with what John has said. And actually, just in yesterday, um, the allocation has gone up. It's now 7.8 million just from yesterday allocated um, with 76% of the total allocation. And 98% of the applications received have been paid. So the administration of the scheme is working very effectively. And it has, I mean, the scheme opened for applications on the 27th of July. Um, and at this stage, you know, 98% of the applications have been paid on and 76% of the total grant has been paid out and will continue. The scheme is still open until the 11th of September. I'm delighted that the, the allocation has been rolled out as it should be and uh, I've long raised concerns in relation to it and the impact it's having uh, on the sector, particularly childminders. But I still have grave concerns about the figures that I'm reading that it costs £22,000 per week to administer a scheme to allocate and distribute funds to register childminders in, uh, in the sector, or, or to the, throughout the sector, sorry, the child care recovery scheme. So £22,000 per week. So uh, are you seriously telling me that that is value for money? £88,000 in a month, £176,000 across the two months of distribution. It's a serious amount of money. It, it, it is, yes, absolutely. But what I would say, there was a full IT system that had to be developed, an online system, um, because we took on board criticisms from the first scheme in which it was a hard copy system. So we're talking about an IT system being developed and implemented. We're talking about about 5,000 applications potentially that had to be an individual invite sent out with email links. All the stuff can be uploaded online. There is no hard copy, no... Um, difficulty in terms of bureaucracy in that and the scheme is paying out an average within six to nine days um, and behind that will be all the reporting analysis and all the stuff that we need behind that and there does need to be people to administer and check there is a verification and checking element still to be done and you need the resources and the staffing to do that is it, is it, my, my question is quite direct do you, the department for education believe that this is value for money in terms of the distribution, given the cost, 88,000 pounds per month, 176,000 well, um, let me Let me put it this way. Um, the cost of providing that service as a proportion of the overall value of the fund is something like 2%. That's a 2% overhead. 200,000 out of 10 million. Would that be right? So, and as you would know, Value for money is not just about price, it's about economy, efficiency and effectiveness. So is this scheme effective? I would say it is. Is it being dealt with and administered uh, in an, ad, <coughs> excuse me, is it being dealt with in an administratively efficient manner? I would suggest it is. Uh, and for an overhead price of about 2% of the value of the fund, that doesn't seem to me to be an extortionate price to pay for a well-run scheme that is delivering support in a timely manner to a sector that is in dire need of support and recovery. 
there's no doubt that the sector's in dire need of support and recovery. And as I've said, I and other colleagues in this committee have long argued that that should be the case and that the department should be leading from the front instead of being pushed from the back uh, in relation to this issue. But I still have concerns, and we're not going to agree today, but there's still concerns in relation to the cost of the allocation of distributing funds to the this sector that desperately needed the funds. I don't believe £88,000 per month is value for money, but we will explore that further. Just on another point, uh, considering the terrible problems there have been around the awarding of grades for GCSE, AS and A2 levels this year, will the department release to us the advice furnished to the department and indeed the minister, but that will be a question for the minister, by SIA uh, and the subsequent directions to SIA from the department and indeed obviously that question will be for the minister as well. So in other words, who is advising who uh, and can the advice be furnished uh, so that we can consider what advice and guidance was given that uh, uh, resulted in the department reaching the conclusions that they did uh, in relation to the matter around grading. Well, as you say, that, that's uh, a matter for the Minister, Daniel, and we'll consider that request uh, when, when we receive it. Well, the Minister would seek advice, uh, undoubtedly. That's why either a Permanent Secretary and the Deputy, Deputy Permanent Secretary and others who would give advice. There would have been advice received by SIA. I think it's important in the interest of transparency, given how badly handled this was, has been, not just by SIA, by the Minister and by the Department of Education, uh, uh, as to what that advice was. Uh, we're seeing quite a bit of transparency around the model in England that was used and how much of a price that was. Heads have ruled as a result of it. There still needs to be a kind of build around what advice was given, who advised who, uh, and who ultimately made the decision as to what advice was taken. So I, I will raise that with the Minister, but I want to put on record with yourself, as the Deputy Permanent Secretary for the Department. The Chair, if you'll go ahead, just a final question. Go ahead. Uh, 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 I'm trying to be as sharp as possible. Uh, I've raised this uh, you're learned, you're learned, you're as well you're with the <laughs> Go ahead. I've raised this. Uh, you both, uh, I, I, I've, um, I've raised this continually with the department, indeed with your colleague uh, Derek Baker, and with the minister uh, and the EA as well over a, a number of months. And that is around the C2K service. Uh, there is considerable issues being reported from schools in relation to it, including file server failures and very slow loading speeds in terms of the system. We're aware that the C2K infrastructure is now quite old and appears to be delays in awarding the contracts. In fact, I have understood that, that, that there hasn't even been a tender process uh, opened yet. I understand that the C2K system uh, went out of date in 2017 and should have been replaced in 2017. There was an extension to 2019 and now we are close to 2021. I, uh, I, I'm just wondering uh, what the situation is in relation to this from the Department of Education and the DDA, uh, given the officials or uh, directors are there, uh, and surely given the crisis situation that we're in uh, around blended learning and around the need to ensure that we have continuity of learning and minimal disruption to learning of children, um, uh, given that there could be an outbreak in a school and the school goes any time, what is happening in relation to this system, a system that we will heavily rely on in some subjects, the majority of subjects, in fact? Well, Daniel, from the department's perspective, and I think the EA as well, you know, clearly the C2K system is really integral to the way that uh, it supports schools to deliver the curriculum, and it's in everybody's interests that we have a seamless uh, service that, that runs medium to long term in the future. Uh, in terms of the procurement, I know that our colleagues in the finance director is working really closely with colleagues in the EA in terms of overall oversight of the project in that regard. Uh, and the EA are trying to, uh, to move this forward uh, as, as quickly as they can. I don't know, Dale, if you would yeah, want to I mean, expand on that. Daniel, I mean, I, I, I'm not aware that there are technical issues and we will take that back and investigate that, but in terms of the C2K system as it currently stands, we believe that, that it, it can continue to meet the needs of the schools until such times as the new system is put in place. There is a procurement um, exercise on the way, the project is in place. Um, yes, we've got some very challenging time scales around that to meet that. And I think um, last week my colleague Michelle did update the, the, the committee on that. But look, we, we, we take away the piece that you're saying that there appears to be technical issues. I, I'm not aware of that. Well, two, two th thanks very much for answering, Neil. Uh, and uh, good, good to see you today as well. Uh, 
just in terms of uh, the concerns raised by the server failures has been reported, uh, and that's come from very reliable sources, and also slow loading speeds as two of the biggest challenges in relation to it. My point is that if the demand increases on the system, that the system could fail, uh, and if it fails, then there is going to be maximum disruption to uh, the education of our young people, particularly in terms of blended learning. I'm just wondering, Dale, or, 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 or either of you or any of you to finance it, when is this going to go to tender? It is three years beyond the date that it should have been updated. And John, you've said that we're trying our best to get this sorted. Why has it taken why is there so much delay in relation to this if it is such an integral part of our education system? Daniel, we, we do have a project in place. Um, we're currently finalising and working our way through the outline business case. Um, and once that is agreed, then we can put in place um, the, the procurement exercise. But we, we absolutely know that we have a definitive um, date in 2021 that we have to have that in place. And the schedule for that is on track. I can't tell you exactly the, the, the month that the procurement exercise is going to start. But look, there's a project plan in place. Um, it is being managed and um, the Education Authority is confident that we will be able to deliver the new system as required. Okay. Dan, I'm going to have, this, I'm gonna have to stop you there. Apologies. I think I should say... Sorry, John, you know, go me, ahead. Meanwhile, until that, until that happens, the, the incumbent provider is still under contract to continue to support and maintain Absolutely. the system as they would have been from, uh, the, the, uh, from day one of the contract. So it's not the case that the the EA now has an unsupported system that is uh, at risk of falling over. Uh, the, the, the maintenance and the contracts are still in place. Okay, thank you, John. Dan, we're going to have to stop you there. Apologies. Uh, just on, on that briefly, as, as Daniel had said, um, John, you've referred to, so C2K is the Northern Ireland Schools ICT system, and you've referred to it as integral to the way schools deliver the, the curriculum. Uh, I'm willing to stand corrected, but I, my recollection of the Northern Ireland Teaching Council's contribution this morning in relation to C2K was we are finding ways to work around it. Um, that, that's the Northern Ireland Schools ICT system. So the, the, the version um, of the Northern Ireland Teachers Council, the issues that Daniel has raised today, seems to show significant concern with regards to the operations of C2K. Um, you'll accept that? Well, I, I can't comment on, on, on what they said and on the specific uh, areas as to why they might feel that they need to work around the system. Um, what I would say is, as the EA um, operates and, and oversees that system and they have in place uh, oversight mechanisms and processes to make sure that any issues in terms of performance are, are dealt with and rectified. Um, I can't comment on individual situations why teachers might feel that they need to, to work around uh, the system. Okay, um, I, I'm going to move yeah. on. Does, does it cause the department or the education authority concern that we are hearing people are finding ways to work around the system? rather than be able to use a system that you say is integral to the way schools deliver the curriculum? Well, I think we need to, we need to surface what these, these concerns actually are, and I'm sure that the EA has, has ways of doing that. Um, but, you know, I would, one thing that strikes me is you remember before we took the summer break and the plethora of data that we used to provide to you on a weekly basis about the use of the C2K system and the number of hits per day that that system was generating, uh, which ran into tens of thousands, uh, if not more, every day. I don't have the figures to hand because it, it's a couple of months ago. But you know what I would say is that, that uh, certainly on the basis of the data that we were giving you then, that didn't look to me like a system that, that was being widely worked around. It looked to me as if it was being a system that was widely used and logged onto by both uh, students and teachers alike. I suppose it depends on what its functionality was once it was logged on to. Anyway, I need to bring Robbie Butler in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for joining us uh, again this week, guys. I'm going to change tact a little bit, although we'll be revisiting one of the topics that the Vice Chair brought up earlier. It's in around free school meals. Um, could you give us an update on the application 
um, process the system um, any outstanding issues because I've had reports over the weekend where in one school up to 50% of those that had applied hadn't had an answer and there are some reports of some kids missing out on lunch or, um, because they went in uh, without a packed lunch and, and, belie and believed that the child would be fed and may not have been the case in the school. So 50% in one school is a very alarming figure. Um, could you give us an update if there are any issues with that process please? Robbie, I can pick that up. Um, yes, there, there, there was an issue um, at the outset and it was in relation to the verification uh, through jobs and benefits offices around um, people's incomes, etc. Um, and that did delay us in terms of processing application forms. So in terms of free school meals, we, we, pro we process approximately 50 to 60,000 forms per year. Uh, the vast majority of those will be like a roaming basis and it's, it's the parents coming back the following year. Um, as it currently stands at the start of this week, we were up to about 80% of the forms that we had anticipated would be processed. Um, so we were behind by about a week. Um, we anticipate that by the end of this week, we will have all of the application forms that we've received uh, into the Education Authority will be processed. Um, as a mitigation, we, we did write out to all schools at the start of the school year and advise that even if they had um, not been notified that vulnerable children or children that were entitled to free school meals didn't have their free school meal entitlement verified, that they were to go ahead and provide the child with a free school meal. So look, that, that, that arrangement is still in place and of course no child will be turned away. Um, and they will get a free school meal. So from my perspective, if there are individual cases, but please bring those back to me offline and I'll address those. Thank you for that, Dale. I'll certainly furnish you with the details um, after the meeting today and I'll join the calls from the Deputy Chair with regard to the sooner that we can get the hot meal provision safely up and running, uh, the better it will be for, for those kids. I asked a question um, last week. It was in and around the helpline uh, for principals. Um, I asked uh, if there would potentially be an extension of it to out of hours, so beyond 5 p.m. Um, has that been thought about, looked at at this point, or is it still under consideration? R Robbie, at this stage is still under consideration. Um, the s services that we've operated over this weekend from the EAS perspective has been successful, um, and, and we've been able to make contact with principals that have required advice outside of normal office hours. So, as it currently speaks, Robbie, we're, we're not intending to open the hotline or the helpline um, evenings and weekends, but look, it's still under consideration. No problem. I just I appreciate that if it was just kept under consideration, and, and, and I suppose in terms of the, we report maybe even on the volume of, of, of the um, calls that you're getting would be useful to, 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 to just gauge how appropriate it is. I've only got one more question, Chair, um, and that is to do with the wellbeing guidance I think was put out at the start of, uh, sort of middle of August. Um, but one of the commitments in that guidance was to regularly review the guidance to ensure that it was appropriate and the, I know there are a number of online um, systems available for pupils to, to, to access. So could you tell me, has there been a review of sort of the evidence-based uh, revision of pupils having returned now? Um, and if not, would there be the possibility that that would be the case, that there would be learning taken sort of live, if you like, from the, the, the pressures that pupils are facing in terms of either updating or improving the wellbeing guidance? Robbie, I, I could maybe... Uh address that one. Um, yep, we will be, uh, the guidance will be reviewed. I think, I'm not aware that the review has taken place yet. That's not to say it hasn't, it could have, I just don't know. Um, but what I would say is um, we've got only a couple of weeks of, of schools back, so the evidence to, to, to inform a review might need to wait a couple more weeks until schools have, have got three or four weeks, five weeks of, of uh, of learning back under their belts before we before we start to to do that, so we could uh, uh, do any review on a more informed basis. Yeah, Grant, and, and I suppose what I'm pointing towards, just in regards to the evidence gathering, is that it is it's evidence based, and that would that would include feedback from maybe even the children's commissioner with regard to the appropriateness of the well-being and the performance of 
the, the guidance and systems that are in place and if that can be something that you guys look into um, I think your, your answer there, John, is fine. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a good point. You know, if we committed to do a review, that's what we will do. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, folks, for your evidence today. Um, can I ask, guys, um, I met with five principals last week, and they have a litany of concerns, and the stress levels they are experiencing is, is phenomenal. And they're, they're actually saying that their their teaching staff witnessing the, the, the challenges that their the principal uh, principals are facing that nobody will ever want to be a principal after watching what the, what the principals are going through and experiencing right now in terms of the demands on the challenges they're facing and the um, ambiguity around all sorts of issues about what what directions they should take and it's just they're totally totally stressed out. Um, can I ask what percentage of DE EA Staff are working from home. Sorry, say again, Justin. What what? What percentage of DE and EA staff are working from home? Okay, uh, I can answer that from a departmental perspective. Uh, the significant majority of our staff are working from home. Um, you'll be aware, in line with the executive's uh, decision-making process document that they published back in in uh, May, I think it was. Uh, which says that the default is uh, people should work from home if they can work from home. So over the course of the early summer, we provided uh, the, the vast majority of our staff uh, with uh, IT uh, laptops and, and in some cases they took their desktops home to be able to work from home and that is the default position. Now, we are aware, we, we in terms of Rathgale House and uh, Waterside House, our, our buildings never closed uh, to staff, they've always been open, but we are putting in place plans to facilitate safe return uh, of, of staff to the buildings uh, when it's appropriate for them to do so. And there could be any number of circumstances why staff might need uh, to come back to work. But as of today, uh, the significant majority continue to work from home. Uh, typically, on any given day, there may be up to 100 staff on site uh, across uh, Rathgale and Waterside House. Okay, Until thank you, John. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Dale. Justin, I was just going to give you feedback from an education 30 point of view, and I don't want to be disingenuous because actually, probably what you're asking is about corporate staff. So, in terms of EA staff, the vast majority of EA staff are actually on the front line. So that includes your drivers, cleaners, classroom assistants. So they're actually working on the front line. In terms of our corporate staff, um, what, what we did was we decided that we needed to put in place arrangements to make sure that the organisation could continue to operate in a way to keep schools operating. So from COVID began, we identified a range of critical services that needed to remain within um, needed to remain operational and needed to be within the office. So for example, those would be our free school meal and student finance colleagues, it would be staff within our CYPS directorate and SEM, it would be payroll, it's accounts because obviously we need to make sure that our suppliers etc continue to be paid and our transport colleagues. So um, what we've done is, is a take a blended approach really in terms of our staff so that staff that have to be in, they're in and we, we maintain social distancing from them so that they can provide the services, the critical services to the schools and then um, a number of st corporate staff that can work from home and if they can work from home effectively have continued to work but it wouldn't be difficult to provide an exact number and we can provide that at a later date, I just don't have the figures. Yeah, my point is guys, um, the principals, um, I, I fully in, in support and encourage the facility to be there for staff to be at home and safe in their home in their own environments uh, in, the, in the midst of this pandemic. But the issue is principals are at the cold face of, of uh, dealing with the challenge that they're facing and they cannot get contact, they cannot make, uh, make a contact with the, the information that they need in the education authority within DE. They have the link officers, they've said the link officers are working very, very diligently and working very effectively communicating with the schools, but they cannot get the answers to the questions they need when they need them. When they're trying to make contact with the, with the EA, they can't get through, they, they can't get response. That's been ongoing, and the teachers and the principal on their head out. 
And I don't specifically want a response to that, but that's that is the, the facts. Those are the facts on the ground. And you, you mentioned last week, John, that if if it's safe for a pu- for a pupil to be in school this time last year, it's safe for a pupil to be in school this time now, and because of the, the measures that are in place. If that is the case, why is it not safe for the support staff to help kids? with special educational needs to be in schools, to so give them the support they need. Why have there been no special uh, learning difficulty support services provided to the schools face-to-face within the school environments? Why has there been no healthcare support for children who have di- are diabetic, uh, or children who are diabetic, where nurses will have trained up the classroom assistants to give the diabetic support to those kids? Why have they not been in the schools? So it's, it's okay for education authority staff to stay at home to protect themselves, but the people, the kids who need the support, where they need it in the schools, they're not there to help them. Uh, I, I, can, I can answer both on two points here. Uh, the first is that, as I understand it, the health trusts uh, have been instructed to bring back all of their uh, uh, engagement with schools in terms of uh, speech and language, uh, psychology services, everything else, uh, they are only, as I understood it, they were beginning from the, uh, were to begin from September. Uh, again, they're going to have a reduced capacity to deal with individuals because they themselves will have to wear PPE and bring in other mitigations and controls because they're bringing in, coming in and out of various schools. But the understanding from health is that all of their existing systems would be back and operational. And that, you know, to the, to the extent that we can do anything in that, that's we're relying on them to do it. The secondary issue here is about the understanding of the difference between in, in the system of controls around where around reducing transmission. Um, the chief medical officer agreed our system in terms of opening schools with all of the individual controls that we put in place and mitigations, which allows a large amount of people to go back to, to school activity in terms of the workforce, in terms of pupils, and in terms of uh, the wider society trying to get back. On the other side of that, there are very strict controls around when we as individuals can meet and can meet. And there's a balance here. You loosen up to allow schools to do things and you bear down and tighten on everything else. And that's the system that's in place across our society, which has allowed schools and workforces and our health system, etc., to, to go on. And I understand, I mean, I work from home. I'm working 24-7. Uh, I'm working Saturdays and Sundays and everything else to get this done and to make the best of this uh, and and whatever else. And I I entirely sympathise with our education community, but the system isn't put in place to allow them to open up. And on the other side of that, we're closing down and have held down restraints within other parts of the society to make sure that the overall rate of transmission is controlled. And, And as you can see in England today, if the rate of transmission uh, continues to increase, then you get local lockdowns and closures. But even in those local lockdowns in Bolton, which was announced yesterday, children are going to school. Okay, it is fundamentally the safe system in schools, but you have to lock down everything else to make it work. Well, we okay, it. listen, I appreciate the efforts you're all going to and the stress that you're under as well, so I recognise that. Uh, teachers, uh, risk assessments are uh, bureau, bureaucratic and cumbersome and very, very time consuming. You have to fill one out every time there is a child who reports with uh, Ill, any illness. Um, t- totally uh, too, too demanding on their time. Um, COVID budgets, is there a pro rata uh, budget for, for uh, schools? Or and plus a specific budget for schools where they might need one? In terms of what expenditure? COVID. Just in-, in terms of the COVID budget for schools, where they still haven't ha- actually had one allocated, where schools are now paying uh, bills either off their own checkbooks without having an allocation for the, the demands that are being placed in terms of additional cleaning regimes, in terms of additional staff, in terms of uh, um, PPE, where is there a pro rata budget for schools with an additional budget where, where required? Okay. Um, obviously, this this came up uh, uh, and, and received extensive discussion last week at this committee. Um, the EA is a funding authority for schools, and the EA advised schools about the funding that was available to them, and that went out last Wednesday on the second September. The allocations to schools for PPE and other COVID nineteen related costs. Now that excludes teacher substitution, which is dealt with slightly differently. They've been made on a per pupil basis, 
and that's in line with, uh, with other jurisdictions and reflects the funds that have been... Can you answer me quickly? So I met with the principals last Wednesday morning, so it probably has been superseded since that, so thank you. Um, in terms of, they, they said there's a financial crisis that's uh, going to become an educational crisis, but I think that you've addressed that. Testing kits, teachers feel that they are not medics and not uh, qualified to be able to say who should get one, who shouldn't. Um, they're very concerned at the widening of the educational gap um, in terms of uh, what we've already discussed with the, the union that we represented earlier today. Um, but I think one fundamental issue I want to raise, and CPD is another issue where it's just been called a halt to that for teachers. Um, but one particular issue which I've raised on numerous, numerous occasions, guys, at this committee, and I'm not getting an answer on it. And it's, it's very, very concerning for me. And Robin touched on it earlier. Um, and for too long in this, this society, on this island, vulnerable kids and vulnerable people have been left behind. I want to know what has been done proactively to ensure that no kid is unsafe in their own home and those kids, those children who have been unsafe in their own homes throughout the length of this pandemic and who had no release, no escape for school because schools were closed down. How, how has that been proactively addressed by Education Authority, by, by DE? Can tell me, give me the information, what has been done and what, what is the data? You know, for, for vulnerable children in their own home, I would have thought that's primarily an issue for the health services uh, and, and social services. Um, you know, we're focused on what goes on in schools. Sorry, John, John, that, 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 that doesn't wash. That doesn't wash. That's, that's passing the buck. I think the society has a responsibility to ensure that no child is unsafe in their own home. An education authority and DE has a role to play in that. So it's not a question of saying that's a role for social services, that's a role for the health of our health. We've all got a think, problem here. No, that, that's, that's a fair point. A fair point, Justin. But, you know, I think thinking back to previous uh, committees that we, we, we discussed this, this point before the summer, um, we have um, close working with our colleagues in Department of Health in terms of the emotional health and wellbeing framework. The multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary panel processes have been set up to assess uh, vulnerable children in terms of their needs and there is work ongoing between the department and health and the different agencies therein to, to, to take that forward. Um, in terms of the detail, you know, we, we'd need to come back to you on that but you know, it's not something that we, uh, we don't take seriously, we do. Um, and there are, there are processes in place. Now, if we need to come back to you with more detail, I do think we may, may have answered this earlier on in the year, but we can, we can relook at that and come back to you again. And John, I'm just going to have to, 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 to finish this up. Information on this case. I want to know that this has been proactively addressed within the department of the NEA. I want to know that it's happening. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Justin, if I could say as well on your behalf to join the department, um, to be fair to Justin, he raises this question at every single session. Um, you, you might want to have a more detailed answer for him one of these days. Um, I think, on, sorry, if I can back in, fundamentally, if, if the, the care of those, of those children uh, within the school environment is our responsibility within the education system, but in terms of the engagement with health, um, health are the ones who will have a report of a child that is vulnerable and we in the education system will only become aware of that when they pass that information to us. So to that extent they are the custodians of that and the lead on that and we will have to be guided by them in terms of what we can do. It's an, and, and you know I understand Justin or you, you want to see us being proactive in managing that. And one of the key things that we did right at the very start was to make sure that the uh, at schools that were open for key workers included a definition where vulnerable children could be brought to school all the way through the uh, initial stages of the pandemic and that the vulnerable children were also brought in in that uh, the early phase of our opening of schools so that they could so that schools would be engaging with them and with their families etc and then you become part of the normal engagement of the school as you roll forward into September so it's not as if these children have been left behind and we have been looking at them, but it is health-led, fundamentally, and we will work with them in terms of how we continue to support them. Justin, okay. thanks, thanks for your questions. I, I, I appreciate you continuing to raise that issue. I, I think we will want to continue to raise it as a committee, but I'm going to have to stop us at that point. Um, okay. Can I ask... Thank you, folks. Thank you.
Thanks, Justin. Uh, John, very, very quickly, you, you, as you said there, in terms of that funding mechanism, substitute teachers are dealt with differently. Um, it, it's come to my attention that the funding available for so teacher cover, for additional teacher cover, it, uh, a criteria for accessing that funding is, is if a teacher in your school um, is off due to COVID. It's not funding that's available to increase the number of teachers that are at your school in order to improve the pupil-teacher ratio or to create smaller bubbles if you have extremely clinically vulnerable children. Why is that the case? I, I can't talk about the funding system, but it goes back to the fundamental premise of the, the controls and mitigations are in place. We, the, the guidance from the, the public health agency, from the chief medical officer, is that our existing classrooms and our existing class sizes and the mitigations that we have in place are appropriate. Um, it, it can, you know, and, and therefore, I'm very sure that the criteria is set up to make sure that we don't. It's a system where we want, we know that people will be off in terms of being positively tested or precautionary isolation, and we want to cover that to make sure they're not affected by that. But it's not a backdoor means to increase your classroom capacity to try and do uh, anything else within the education system. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting it's a backdoor. I'm suggesting it should be a front door assistance to our schools. Um, so just to be clear, DE is funding um, cover for teachers who are off due to COVID. It is providing no funding for any additional teaching human resource to try and improve class sizes or provide bespoke bubbles. It is purely just the cover for if a teacher is off due to COVID. You're providing no additional resource for additional teaching staff otherwise. Well, Chair, all, all I would say is that um, the fund for teacher substitution costs is we've allocated the funding. It's been managed by the EA. It will be allocated to schools based on verified costs. In terms of the precise uh, rules around how that funding is, is uh, and what it's available to pay for, we'll need to come back to you because that's, that's, that's the responsibility of the Education Authority. And I, I don't have the answer to that. So you, you don't know the criteria on which funding is being allocated for additional teaching resource in schools? No, I'm, I'm not the finance director for the department. And as I said, the, the, the fund is being centrally managed by the EA. Uh, so if you need, if you need detail on, on the criteria for the fund and how it's managed, we'll need to get back to you on that. Uh, we're not trying to catch you out here, John. The, the funding for additional teaching resource seems to be a fairly fundamental piece of additional resource that our schools would need in order to reopen safely, in order to consider pupil-teacher ratios, in order to consider bespoke bubbles. Um, Adrian said that the, P the CMO and the PHA have, have said all, all school classroom sizes are, are safe. There, there's, the, the school guidance was based on a classroom size of 60 metres squared. There are classrooms across Northern Ireland that are nowhere near 60 metres squared. It doesn't matter about the individual size of the classroom. It matters around the process and systems of controls around uh, uh, basic hand hygiene coming in and out of the school, and regular hand hygiene during the day, and about catch it because of that, and about normal cleaning processes being uh, adopted. The system in place is that the entirety of that. If you've got a classroom, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I was taught in a, in a two classroom school in the middle of the room with four individual uh, classes or three individual classes within one room, those classrooms still exist. Um, and they are very small, they will continue to be very small, but um, the guidance is that social distancing is relaxed within the individual pupils, but that the staff should maintain social distancing where possible between themselves, between adults and between the children. That is a sensible risk measure which, uh, which controls the risk of mitigation here and means that the existing t teaching process can continue as normally. If you have 32 pupils in a 40 metre squared class with a teacher and two classroom assistants, how can you maintain social distancing of any degree? 
there's no expectation that you would be able to maintain that. You're operating with a teacher and two classroom assistants effectively in a bubble. And uh, there, if, as long as those teachers and classroom assistants maintain hygiene, even if they move to A in another class, then the operation of that is a safe way of doing that. You're reducing transmission by increasing segmentation and, and, and also by the basic hand hygiene that you've got. There is no expectation here that, that you can maintain uh, social distancing in every situation. It's, it's impossible, and it's also impossible in our wider society. It's about getting a balance between being able to open an active classroom and to engage in normal learning in a process that is contained. And the containment is not at the individual level in a classroom, it's about the classroom level, about creating a bubble which is safe. And the bubble itself allows teaching to, get, to be got on with as normal. Regardless of the size of the bubble, regardless of whether there's an extremely clinically vulnerable pupil in the bubble? As I said, extremely clinically vulnerable pupils are treated as normal pupils, and that's the guidance from the PHA as of this week. Uh, and that's the guidance that's applying across the UK. Uh, we've taken a classroom-based position on uh, bubbles. Uh, Scotland have taken a position where entire year groups are bubbles. Uh, that's the position taken in Holland and in Denmark. France also used classrooms. They're a very different position in terms of what can be used. All are equally effective. You're reducing the number of transmission point, uh, possible transmissions. The, the smaller your bubbles, the better. But you know, you, you could break your classes down into three and hire two additional teachers. But the cost of that is absolutely astronomical and wouldn't actually have a real benefit in terms of reducing transmission. Okay, that's helpful. There won't be additional funding to do that. That's, that's clear. Okay, at least there's clarity on that. Okay, thanks very much indeed for your briefing today. Uh, folks, um, we'll, we'll obviously be engaging with you on, with these issues on an ongoing basis. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Clark, do you want to summarise any key actions um, resulting from that briefing? So, Chair, if I could ask Assembly Broadcasting to uh, remove the witnesses and put uh, members uh, back into the spotlight again. So. Um, if members are content, then uh, we'll, uh, the committee will, um, and there's a bit of a list here, but so keep me right. So we're writing to the Department of the Education Authority, um, asking them to comment on the reported underperformance of the C2K system and seeking a further update on the C2K procurement process. Agreed. Um, then, is that agreed, members? Agreed. Yeah. Members, if we can move promptly through this, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, then agreed. Clark, also, thank you. are the committee writing to the Public Health Agency and asking them if they'll provide us with a weekly update of pupil staff um, COVID rates in schools? Yeah. Agreed. Uh, then, writing to the yeah. departments, uh, seeking a few things. Firstly, comparison of uh, attendance rates for students and staff with previous years. Um, indicating um, the committee's surprise, disappointment, that the consultation on the curriculum didn't apparently include the practitioners group or the stakeholders group and suggesting that it should. Agreed. Um, on mobile testing, um, perhaps the committee are right into the department suggesting that it coordinate closely with the PHA and perhaps reconsiders um, the position on how available the mobile testing units are going to be. Uh, they do say something about it in their update yeah. note. Uh, okay, and then additionally... Can I, can I just see to specify on that one, Clark? Is it worth us asking, we ran out of time, how many pupils in a school would need to be symptomatic okay. to activate yeah. a mobile, mobile yeah. testing okay. unit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. No Thanks. problem. Uh, then uh, asking the department about training for blended learning uh, and further guidance. When was that provided? When will it be provided again? Uh, then asking about the percentage of uh, school hot meals which have been provided both generally and for free school meals to children and also just seeking an update then on the application process when hopefully yep. the things have been resolved. But so, yeah, I think you made a commitment by the end of the week, it could be 100% but we need to know that for sure. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. great. And then great. on community creches, um, I think there's the committee asking that the uh, department reconsider um, the, that the support should be made available for those who are not necessarily in receipt of Sure Start. Um, okay. Great. And okay. then um, asking for further information on the volume of calls uh, to the helpline, yep. just to see how that's going. Agreed. And then perhaps writing to the Education Authority, asking them to set out the rules for allocating teaching resources to substitute teachers, as the department could not. Agreed. Then 
maybe writing to health, committee, uh, Department of Health, um, asking about vulnerable children. Um, I, I'm sensing from Mr. McNulty that he was not satisfied with the answers that we have received over the past couple of months on this. Uh, maybe the committee is working towards something else on this, say even a committee motion, if it doesn't get a satisfactory answer on something around cooperation between those departments. Mm -hmm. But just asking what have they done? What is the update um, on those vulnerable children and the um, support that has been provided to them during lockdown and now that we're returning? Great. And then finally, writing to the minister, as I think Mr. McCrossan suggested, um, asking to see the guidance which uh, the minister provided to SIA and the, the pushback that SIA provided to the minister around the grading um, situation. Yeah, and that, that's basically just to establish uh, who, who was advising who and whose advice was taken. Uh, I think we need to see if the minister went to SIA for the guidance and then uh, took the advice given or is it the way about. But either way, I'm still adamant that we need to see some kind of way around we actually took the decision and based on what advice that the decisions were taken on. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Clark. Yeah. 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 Members. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. yes. So, Who's that? Um, is there a possibility that we can, um, maybe this question was sufficiently answered, but is there merit in considering writing to the department for an outline of how uh, funds would be distributed to the schools and what, what is the mechanism by which schools bid for additional funds and there's a pro rata, just, just clearly outlining to us what, what that mechanism is. Chairperson, we, we asked, the committee asked this question last week and um, I think John Smith indicated a written answer is coming back. So uh, we will, we'll take up the gauntlet again next week if you don't get an answer, but we've asked, the committee has asked the question and indicated that it expects a, I think it was the first question the, the chair asked, yep. they expect a simplified mechanism which schools will find understandable around how that money uh, is going to be allocated, including the questions that the, the members just covered. So if you're happy with that... Because that schools are in because of the payments they've already made. How is that going to be addressed? I think I'll be covered in it, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. okay. Yes, but good question. Right. Um, already committed. I would have thought... This should be crying. Yeah, I, th I think it's right for the committee to be asking questions about the allocation of the... The funding, Justin and other members. Um, uh, the the message from the minister was that that whilst this was a, a a full return to school, that it would not be business as usual. Um, and yet, much of the evidence that we're receiving here is that bar bubbles that are breached fairly regularly outside of the particular classroom um, and and cleaning and hygiene. There's, I, I, don't, I don't know what the extent of the mitigations are. I, th I think multiple members had asked, I know, I know I had asked and my colleagues had asked, what additional funding would be available to try and improve people teaching staff ratios and, and, and matters like that. It, it's fairly clear from the evidence there today that there will be no funding no. outside of covering a teacher that is off due to COVID. There will be no, uh, uh, or, or additional funding to cover um, additional teaching staff that might be needed to focus on blended learning that is consistently raised that? with us as well. So um, I think that's pretty concerning. Sorry, did someone else want to come in briefly? Conscious, we need to get the yeah. correspondence, Clark. Just on that, Chair, in relation to the uh, cover for teachers that are off, but we're, we're still waiting on the Department for Finance from the papers. The Minister of Finance to sign off on the scheme. Is, is that? That's still, that's accurate, isn't it? Yeah, Sorry, what was that? We're, we're, still, we're still waiting on finance to sign off on the funding uh, that is needed in order to pay for these sub teacher. No, I, th I, th I think there is a budget in place at, at the Department for School Restart in, in the region yeah. of £40 million. Pounds. I think £10 million pounds of that is allocated for um, teaching. Um, budget but it, but what what I'm saying is that it appears from a, a criteria basis um, that that is that is to cover teachers who are off on COVID it's not to provide schools with additional additional teaching staff to creatively or innovatively or safely respond to COVID and the challenges that it presents in terms of vulnerable pupils um, you know maybe particular schools that have particularly small classrooms with particularly large classes um, they're as far as I can see, the Department of Education is saying 
every classroom, every class size is safe as long as it's a bubble. Um, no, I, I think we'll want to look at that in a bit more detail. I'm, I'm conscious that we need to move on to correspondence, Clark, so let you finish there. Is that, Indeed. Is that uh, it? Yeah. Chair, just to advise members, page 52 of the tabled items, there is something about additional um, pupils, I think, uh, additional teachers, sorry, um, in there. But um, again, uh, yeah, if members are content with that. Also, just to remind members, question time comes back. Uh, I think education questions Tuesday. might be on your Tuesday. 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 So there's topical questions. There's also assembly written questions are back on again, is my understanding, unless, uh, yep. yeah, full, full yeah. So um, I would invite members, yep, quite properly to um, take advantage of that and uh, so we can get, because I always read the answers that you get and feed them into the notes that I prepare for you. So it's all very helpful. Could I just finish off on that point, Chair? Just, I think the department is planning the Engage programme as the catch up. Mm. Um, and that's why they haven't planned mm. to provide, put any extra teaching and they, they support that. So mm. I think that's their approach. OK. OK. Members agreed with those actions and content to move to correspondence. Clark, I know we've got quite a bit to get through here. If members could bear with us just. We do, members, yep. and we are also, are we above our quorum? I think we are, yeah, we're on six. So, uh, Chairperson, uh, if you're content then, at uh, COVID correspondence, two sets of correspondence, there's a lot of it. Uh, so at page 227 of your packs, we have 17 items of COVID-related correspondence. If you're happy enough, we'll dispose of those um, as per the summary note at page 227 with the following exceptions. So if I go too quickly here, here's where members jump in and tell me to stop. So at 7.2, which is at page 230, with a number of notices issue under, issued under the Coronavirus Act. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of them uh, relates to uh, changes to duties in respect of SEND statements. Just suggesting, Chairperson, that the committee writes to the department just to clarify on this. I think what's happening is that um, during lockdown, the obligations around SEND turned into best endeavours. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going back to normal obligations again. But, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I'll be honest, I've read the notices three times. I still don't understand. So, um, well, I, th I think you're right, Clark. But yes, agreed to mm -hmm. see clarification on that. OK, then, mm -hmm. um, moving swiftly over the others, which are quite interesting. But at items 7.5, 7.6 and 7.7, .7, this is page 265. It's the Equality Coalition, the Equality Commission and Angel Eyes. They're all asking to brief the committee on inclusion issues relating to COVID and restart and, and such like. So, um, again, important issues being yeah. raised. A lot of some of the territory is the same, not identical by any means, but fairly similar. I'm sort of a wee bit of a loss here how members want to deal with this. Um, I think we might struggle to get it into the um, formal meeting schedule. Do you want to try and cover these with informal Starleaf meetings? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, do yeah. that then. Okay, thanks, members. Then moving on to item 7.15 and 7.16 at page 321. This is about the non payment of invigilators and markers by SIA owing to the cancellation of exams. So I'm not sure where members are with this. On the one hand, you could take the view that, you know, it's just like substitute teachers or, you know, people that employ themselves uh, and that a payment should be made. On the other hand, you could argue um, that it is public money. You are paying professionals who are probably in employment to do piecework that they haven't actually done because there were no exams, not their fault, it just didn't happen. So, Chairperson, again, um, uh, we've, we've written about this before. Uh, department there said in August it was considering it urgently. SIA didn't give an answer, I think, when Mr Butler asked them about this uh, the last time. So I'm not sure what we want to do um, at this point. Uh, I could simply forward the DE correspondence to the concerned individual in question. But if members want to do something else. Peter, uh, I've raised this, Chair, with, with, with uh, Justin Edwards and with the Minister and with Derek Baker on numerous occasions. And each time I've been prepared by the Minister and Derek Baker back to Justin Edwards, who has given an assurance to me that they would uh, work to uh, resolve the issue. Now, whatever that means in theater terms is uh, beyond me. But on all the occasions I've raised it, that's the answer I've got. There's a lot of people uh, left in limbo in relation to this. One way or the other, they need to provide some clarification as to what direction they're going in relation to the people that um, uh, depend on that income, uh, and they need to know either way what's going to be happening. Yeah, could we? Could we? I know it makes reference to um, how um, 
invigilators were assisted in other jurisdictions further to non-payment, would it be possible to get some information as to what approach other jurisdictions took? Um, I, I think most jurisdictions endeavoured to make some form of payment to invigilators, um, so it would be good for us to know what that looked like and then perhaps to be able to make more specific requests from the department, is that fair? Yes. I think, I think across the piece, Chair, um, senior invigilators were, were pretty well much looked after across the jurisdictions and then those that weren't seniors perhaps didn't. So but there's been nothing done in Northern Ireland, that's, that's the thing, there hasn't been a thing, so been, uh, no yeah. at all. So I'll um, write the DE in those terms and ask them what happened elsewhere yep. Yep. they want to know. Okay. So it's more than invigilators, guys, it's, it's for the exam markers, yeah, markers as well. Markers, that's right, sorry, yeah, quite right, it's shorthand, and, um, uh, absolutely right. Yep. But surely, surely there should be a scheme that's equivalent to the, the substitute teacher scheme, though, whereby those who are contracted and have specific, uh, have, have a long-standing relationship, surely they have to be uh, recompensed for, for the role that they fulfilled on a yearly basis, a very, very important role, otherwise, uh, where do we go forward from here? I said yeah, that I th last I think, week there wouldn't be any next year. I think there is a. I think there's a sound principle there, Justin. I think if we inform ourselves how it has been dealt with in other areas, that we might be able to inform the case that we put to DE on behalf of those people. Yep. Okay. Very good. If members are content then with that set of correspondence. We'll move on to the next lot. Sorry, that went through so quickly. Okay. Um, so now we're at. I catch up myself. Um, Three to it. Yeah, we certainly are. So 328, where we have 22 items of general correspondence, and the summary note is at uh, 330. Uh, again, I'm asking if members are content just to dispose of the correspondence, as, as it says at 330, with the following um, exceptions. Um, at uh, page 345, this is about youth work policy. Uh, yeah, the Youth Work Alliance came to brief us before uh, the summer and just asked about what's happened to the Youth Council. Youth Council is now defunct with its, um, um, what it does has been taken over by the Education Authority. Mm -hmm. But the correspondent says the Minister is considering a consultation with the sector on where the Youth Council of Northern Ireland goes. So just seeking the committee's agreement to forward this correspondence to the Youth Work Alliance. Yeah. That's a great, great. I just yeah. wanted to tell members that. Okay. Also at 354, Irish Medium Groups, they came as well. Um, that sets out the new funding regime. So um, just again seeking the committee's, the committee's agreement to forward this correspondence to Orm the Nogue and Glorna Mona, who came to us uh, before the summer. Is that okay? Yep. yep. Great, jolly good. Then moving on to uh, yeah, item 8.8 .8 at page 394. This refers to the committee's previous scrutiny of SEND statementing at the Education Authority. Members had asked about bonuses to the directors. Now, bonuses were not paid, but there was pay progression. Um, and that's what performance related to pay means. Um, so that, they answered that question. But also there's another other correspondence from the chairperson of the EA. She has declined to appear before the committee owing to ongoing internal processes at the Education Authority. She indicates that a timeline might be provided on this uh, in September. Um, so can I ask the committee? Chair. Daniel? Yes, Chair, Chair this is point I'm sorry for intervening continually in this, but this is something that's caused me illustration. The Chair of the Education Authority should be presenting before this committee and we shouldn't have to continually repeat ourselves to request that she does. There has been serious issues in relation to EA that we need to have. We won't uh, cross the line or discuss anything in relation to human resource matters, but we need to discuss other issues, particularly around SEM uh, and other matters as well. It is the fact that the chairperson is due to leave that post before the end of this year, and I would very much appreciate that we would put every bit of pressure on her to prepare for this committee before she leaves that position. Yep, here we go. Two members. Yeah, any other members want to come in on that? Fully agree. So, chairperson. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to um, you know, digest some of the reason given for it, and it, because it is, it, it's hard to do so. Um, Stepping down is the reason. Trying to avoid it. I mean, I have, I have no desire whatsoever to, 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 to prejudice important um, review matters within the Education Authority, um, which appears to be the reason being cited for, um, for, for not meeting with the committee. Um, 
I don't think we've done that when we had. Okay. The, yeah. No. I, so the final paragraph from the chair says that I will, however, write to you in September when hopefully the position in terms of the timeline for completion of the internal processes may be clearer. Um, it is now September. Um, are our members content that we would um, make one final request for the timeline um, for the completion of the internal processes? And if if that timeline is not uh, agreeable to us, then then we have we have no other option but to proceed to compulsion to yeah. attend. Yeah, I, I disagree. I disagree. She's using this as a distraction. There's other uh, issues that we need to discuss with the chair of the education authority. Uh, we won't be touching on that. We have other senior officials, including the chief executive, before us, and we have avoided getting into that territory, typically in more recent months. So uh, I think this is a duck and a dive and exercise with the chair of the education authority. Uh, she's in a position of responsibility. We need to uh, hear from her in relation to other outstanding matters uh, that she, uh, that the education authority is responsible for. Uh, I don't think it is acceptable. I think we go back and demand that she appear before us uh, before the end of uh, the month. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the suggestion is, is starkly different to that, Daniel. It, it, it's really just to say, it, is there a, a timeline for completion? If the timeline for completion was provided and that it, it was deemed reasonable by us, then we could schedule uh, attendance of the chair after that time scale. It's, it's really just to provide another opportunity to give detail of, of what that timeline is. Given that the correspondent said it would be possible to do so in September, we're now in September. I don't disagree that the chair ought to come to the education committee and that at all, however, it sounds like for that to happen, we will need to move to compulsion. Clark, can you advise us what that looks like as well? Uh, if they, well, the committee has powers, which are very rare to use to compel persons in papers. Um, we probably, I want to take some legal advice just before we do it, just to be sure. Um, but usually what happens is the um, committee then will apply to the speaker and uh, the speaker may then write to the, the persons in paper, uh, the persons in question. And what's happened previously is they've immediately backed down and um, provided the papers or persons that were required. So, um, okay, so, so uh, kind of move us on, Daniel and other members. If we re uh, respond to the chair of the Education Authority to um, maintain our request for attendance, ask for the timeline for completion of the eternal processes um, and advise that we are taking legal advice with regards to our powers to compel the chair to attend the committee and receive that legal advice and, if necessary, move to compulsion. Is that fair enough? I fully agree, Chair. Uh, we just, uh, it's about sending out a message that we're not going to be dodged. Uh, you know, there are serious issues need to be addressed and those and positions of responsibility and authority need to come for us, but we're not that bad. Uh, we're quite a friendly bunch. Normally. <laughs> The rest is okay. Right. Moving on. Um, <laughs> so then, okay, so you clear on that, Clark? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, so okay. at page four hundred nine, uh, is correspondence from the homeless period campaign. Um, as members that are there are about providing free feminine products in schools. Do members want a formal briefing um, on this? I I would be in favour of of doing so um, if the schedule allows, or if an informal meeting might be a uh, uh, more. A uh, pertinent way to receive the briefing, Clark. What, what okay. does, does the, the schedule? I know is extremely agreed for the next while. Okay, so we'll say informal. That's agreed. Mm -hmm. Great, that's okay, yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, Eight point one two at page four one seven is the DE response to the National Deaf Children's Society. Uh, they've come back on questions about um, initial teacher education bursaries and the reduction in the number of teachers for the deaf owing to um, <coughs> retirements, indicating that. Responsibility for a lot of that lies elsewhere. Um, suggesting just as the interim that the committee forward this to the National Deaf Children's Society and seek yep. their views. Okay. okay agreed. Agreed. And then um, 421 is a DE, page 421 is a DE response to the National Children's Bureau commentary on the wellbeing framework. Um, so I'm suggesting, Chairperson, that the committee are content to forward this correspondence to the NCB and um, also. Uh, I understand that the new children and young persons strategy
um, is to be available in October and that it is revamped. So it's changed a little from what we would have seen before. So if they're content then to seek a briefing on that um, at that time when it becomes available. Yep, great. great. Uh, um, then, yep, yeah, page 430, copy of Bernardo's report on the impact of lockdown on children. The findings are similar. I mean, they do cover a lot of the similar ground. Um, I mean, our committee content to um, sort of forego a formal briefing and maybe try and sweep this and other groups up when we do something about the um, wellbeing framework. Um, so I'm hoping we're able to do some kind of event on that, even if it's only virtual to begin with. Or okay. Yeah, I think it's an event. You can see on the event. It's an important event to do, but but happy enough if we could get the voices together on that. Yeah, because it is, it is broadly similar in terms of the, the evidence, yeah. Okay. Clark, can I, can I, sorry, can I return us to the, um, the Department of Education's response on the emotional health and wellbeing framework very briefly? Um, we specifically raised the role of physical activity in supporting wellbeing, and um, the Department's response um, gives um, what it normally gives mm -hmm. in response, which is that it recommends a minimum of two hours PE per week for all pupils. Um, it does very little, as far as I can see, to monitor whether or not that two hours PE per week actually happens or is is viable to happen, given resources. It's my understanding that the, the ETI was previously scheduled to undertake some degree of review or monitoring of what um, that recommendation looked like in terms of implementation. Could we ask the Department of Education whether ETI has undertaken a review of the um, compliance with the recommendation of a minimum of two hours PE per week. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Are agreed, members. Members agreed. Yep. Great. Good job. Great. Okay. Then, uh, then at um, page four six five, restricted correspondence from a concerned parent uh, relating to an exam appeal. Um, ask members to be careful not to name the individuals involved. Uh, the committee can't get involved in individual cases. Um, and there is further correspondence tabled. So I'm just going to roll these together because there's a few things. Uh, because there's further correspondence from the minister at page 482. He confirms that either a teacher assessment or the SIA award, whichever is higher, will be used, and AS results will not be used. Um, and the, it also tells us about resets in November and March for GCSE single and double award science and in January for GCSE maths and English language, uh, whereas all other GCE and GCSE resets will be in the summer of 2021. Um, now, the committee had already agreed its view on this. It supports the use, use of AS, so it thinks it reckons that um, children should get the best of three. Yep. Um, the AS, the CAG, uh, what the teacher assessed or what CA actually gave them. But what the department has gone for is best of two, and that's what the concerned individual is writing about. As I say, um, the committee has already agreed uh, its position on this. Are members content to go back to the concerned individual in those terms? Yes. I mean, they are, I can, well, I'm sure members can understand their situation. Yeah. They're concerned about their child. Um, but the committee has agreed its position, which is in support of them. Yeah. Yeah. Without, without, without naming the individual case or, 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 or dealing with the individual case, it is is the correspondent aware that I, I'm not sure exactly what le, what stage the appeal got to, Clark? But my understanding, and this is this is a an emerging understanding, is that if you attempt that you you ask a school to appeal a grade for you, the school declines and the board of governors declines, that you can actually raise that direct with SIA. Yeah. Uh, was the correspondent aware of that? Is had that run its course in that regard? Or? I think there were on on. Funny you should say that, because the next bit of correspondence at uh, item uh, 8.19 at page 484 is from a concerned parent complaining about the um, SIA um, appeals process. They were finding it complex, convoluted, confusing, not particularly transparent. So um, I was going to suggest, Chair, that the committee forwards that correspondence to SIA, well, the key points of that correspondence to SIA, just so they can come back then on what is actually happening with the complaints process. I think the first correspondent, I think they had. They, they, there's a further email from them in tabled items, which I think uh, refers. Okay. Um, so they think they had, oh no, it actually okay. had, that refers to their discussion with the minister. Um, but yeah, I think they'd gone through the whole process. Um, I'm not sure that they find it particularly satisfactory. Uh, but there is, then there's other correspondence 
about the appeals process, again, not satisfactory. So um, perhaps uh, the committee could write to see you about that. Okay. Great. Is that agreed? Agreed, yeah. In those terms, right, very good. And that, I thought, was that. Members, if members have any other comments on the correspondence? I know there was a lot there and we flew through it. So thanks, members. Okay. Yep. So, Clark, then. Um, agenda item nine is any other business before I need us to stay briefly for a forward work program. Um, any other business members? No. No, okay. As per agenda, content to go to the private session below. Agreed? Yep. Agreed. Agreed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This